All right, welcome everybody. Today is December 7th, and this is the Battery Park City Committee of Manhattan Community Board 1. Um, I welcome you all to have our discussion uh, today. As noted here on our um, agenda, we're postponing the uh, CB1's position and discussion on the Joint Purpose Fund till January. So we're going to jump right in to our a uh, comment on the Battery Park City's North and West Resiliency Project, the draft scope. Um, and I believe we have quorum. I want to welcome BJ Jones here, Nick Spordone, Gwen Dawson. Uh, looking for all your names here, Claudia for Philom Philomena, who have already been moved over. I thank my committee for being here. I thank Wendy Chapman for coming. Um, in her role as the um, Environmental Protection Committee, being part of this because both are invited. And I know a few of us, a few people are on both committees. I know Jeff is. Betty, are you as well? No, no, you're not. So, but there are the other people who are on both committees. Richard Corman, thank you for being here. Bob, you are. Thank you for waving at me, Bob. Thank you. So I'm glad that we've got to, we've got some representation from both. Um, and I guess we can kind of get started. Lucian, do you want to pull up? Um, we have an agenda because we've got a lot to get through. And I want to make it very clear that we're going to go through this and discuss all seven reaches tonight. And we're going to be looking to have comments upon all seven reaches. We put together a um, a little bit of a agenda because we wanted to have a focus, particularly we want to talk about the ones that seem seem to be least controversial first, um, which, and then leave uh, reaches three, four, and five, which kind of encompass the, the North Cove uh, Marina uh, by Gateway Plaza and that area, Belvedere Plaza. We're going to have a longer discussion about that based on the, on the um, questions, but I'm going to ask everybody to understand that we need to get through all seven. We don't want to spend all day and or all night. Um, but as it is, we're looking at a nice robust three hours. We have we have it kind of parsed out. So um, something to point out is that our focus today is to be framing a resolution that's going to be having um, our committee, our CB1. This is this is the start of the conversation, putting together our comments on the scoping document. That the Battery Park City Authority has the draft scoping document. Um, part of that's why we have to go through the whole thing. So when I tell you time is up, it doesn't mean that you can't ask questions, you can't make comments because the comment period has been extended till December 31st. So everybody, if you can't make the comment here, that's fine. You can make it yourself directly on the website and we'll have all those connections. So nothing here is about stifling anybody's voice. It's just that we have a limited amount of time and a lot of information to get through. Um, with that said, Nick, do I pass it to you? Hey there, good evening, everyone. Only very, very briefly, just to say uh, good evening, everyone. Looking forward to a great conversation as always. And uh, other than that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, to BJ Jones, our president and CEO, who's joining us for the fourth portion of this evening's proceedings. BJ. BJ, great. thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and if um, Lucian, you pull up the the presentation, um, I'll um, I'll kick us off um, here. Although Justine, you you covered much of you know tonight's goal um, beautifully. Good evening, everybody. Um, just briefly, you know, on behalf of the whole Battery Park City Authority, um, I just want to thank the Battery Park City uh, Committee of Community Board One for having us and and the members who have joined and and folks from the community who have joined as well. Um, Justine, as you had mentioned, I, I have um, am joined by um, uh, some colleagues of mine from from the Battery Park City Authority as well as uh, project team members from Arcadis, AECOM, Turner, Big, Scape, and AKRF. Um, we do hope that um, tonight's um, presentation and discussion will help provide um, clarity to the community board and inform um, you know, your comments pertaining to the draft um, scope of work. Um, I did want to note that you know, our most recent public meeting, um, you know, which pertained specifically to that draft scope of of work was as a result um, a, 
pretty prescriptive um, and constrained format conforming with um, the environmental review process that's underway. Um, and so it was a public hearing um, format, but tonight um, our approach will be uh, more typical of our community engagement um, process and kind of keeping with our earnest efforts to provide information to the community and respond to the questions we get um, and uh, incorporate constructive feedback um, that we receive um, into you know, our project plans where, where appropriate. So we're looking forward um, to that. Um, next slide, Lucian, please. Um, Justine, you know, covered, um, you know, our intent uh, with this agenda, a lot of ground um, to cover tonight indeed. And so, um, uh, and so we have grouped things with that in mind to make the most of that time and, and address questions in clusters where we think it'll um, make sense. Um, and, you know, and get to each of the, the reaches um, tonight and, and the questions um, that we've received. So we appreciate your help along the way in trying to pack this all in uh, to tonight's, um, you know, few hours. Um, next slide, uh, Lucian. And, you know, just to, to set the stage um, tonight, please, you know, Remember, as we're going through this information above all else that uh, neither this meeting nor the end of the uh, public comment hearing for the draft scope of work at the end of the month is the last opportunity to provide feedback or input or questions or raise concerns regarding this project. Far from it, as as you'll see, um, there's going to be more opportunities um, for you all to in, engage in this project and um, and ask questions and provide input. As you know, we're still in the early uh, stages of design, so just keep that that in mind. As you know, we're talking about the the draft scope of work and that public comment period, but that is that's very specific. We still have a lot of work to do together. Um, in the coming months and the coming community engagement sessions um, that will be happening um, along along the way. So um, we are going to um, endeavor to address um, as many questions as we can for all of the reaches and the time allotted and um, provide clarifications um, to the previously received questions um, about the draft scope of work and questions we received um, in our September public engagement meeting as well. Um, again, we are going to have more opportunities um, down the road um, for engagement, and so we look forward to your participation and please spread the word to make sure that, you know, stakeholders from the community are, you know, engaging in this process. It's really important to not just learn about it, but provide input um, so we can uh, work through this um, together. Um, also, please note that um, the questions we're speaking to tonight, along with the answers, um, are available in a document that we have posted on um, our new um, uh, website specific to the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project. Um, and uh, Nick is gonna drop that website link um, in the comments, um, if you can, it's bpca.ny.gov slash NWBPCR, but you can also get to that through the resiliency page on our, our regular website. You know, please keep an eye on that. We really try to update that as frequently as we can, you know, to build our library of all of the materials that we share throughout the course of the project. Um, okay, so let's jump in. Um, thank you again, Justine and Tammy and, and everyone uh, for the opportunity. Um, and I am going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Peter uh, Gluss from Arcadis to take us through the next um, portion. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes we, can. we can. Yep. Thank you. So let's jump into this then. Uh, next slide. So we're going to show this image uh, uh, a couple of times throughout the presentation, but this is just sort of a, a roadmap that gives us um, a, a, that gives us an understanding of how the authority is organizing the project into reaches. There's seven reaches. We've 
we've talked about um, these seven reaches. I think you folks are familiar with the, you know, that lingo, and we'll be stepping through each one of these reaches and going to specific questions about each reach, as well as the general questions that are sort of hovering above the reaches themselves. Next slide. So this project is part of a larger program that the city is undertaking for Lower Manhattan. It starts with the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project Upper East there. There's a what we call the BMCR project that's taking place um, between Brooklyn Bridge and Montgomery. Uh, the Seaport Coastal Resiliency Project is going through an ambitious planning effort to sort of reimagine the seaport. As we wrap around the battery, there's the Battery Coastal Resiliency Project. Then there's the Battery Park City Authorities projects. And then north of that is uh, what's going to be in the future, the work that the Corps is doing that's probably gonna be an offshot of their HAT study. So that's the portfolio of projects currently right now in Lower Manhattan. And I think just to note that this project has, has endeavored in the past currently and is constantly in the future gonna be endeavoring to harmonize and synchronize the projects, the design goals, the design approaches for all of these projects so that we uh, construct a system for Lower Manhattan that has consistency in purpose and design intent. Slide. So this is a slide, I know it's a bit difficult to read, but it's a slide that presents uh, two types of schedules. There's a community engagement schedule, and then there's the environmental review schedule. As BJ had mentioned before, we kicked off the environmental review process with that scoping meeting at STI, at Stuyvesant High School. And we're in the process of receiving comments on the scoping document. And then that will proceed with the environmental deliverables that review the project and discuss the impacts that project has. Yeah, this is much better. And then in parallel to that, we have an aggressive schedule to go and do outreach for um, various reaches, and we're thinking about how we're organizing that, whether it's reach by reach or a couple of the reaches that have similarities. And those meetings will be used to present uh, developed design information that the design team is working on, getting feedback that's specific to some of the design choices that are being made. And that's going to be done in parallel to the environmental process. But just to reiterate, um, the representations of the project that you're going to see right now are really graphical representations of the project concepts. The design is just getting underway right now. And so we are very early in the design stages for the project. Next slide. And I wanted to, uh, we wanted to start it off with just a, 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 an overarching conversation about the design flood elevation. We'll try to avoid acronyms during the presentation, but the design flood elevation or the DFE is as the graphic shows on the right, it's it's a stack of the things that are going to increase the height of the water during a storm. So the base of that stack is the design storm itself, which is the hundred year frequency storm that um, we define and is consistent with how FEMA defines that. Then on top of that, we put the sea level rise, which the city is currently projecting as 30 inches. Uh, for sea level rise at 2050 for the 90th percentile. Then on top of that is the interaction between the waves and the structure itself and how the waves um, approach, get generated by the wind and come onto the Bay Park, uh, the Battery Park Authority's property, parkland or the um, elevated platforms and sort of break into the structure that we're designing. And then there's this last component, which is a component of freeboard, which which um, takes into account some statistical uncertainties and um, is, is, is sort of a, um, it, sort of a conservative sort of a, um, um, sort of a sort of a safety factor in a sense, but it also thinks about overtopping as well. So those are the stacks that we're using. Those stacks are consistent with all of the projects that the city is undertaking throughout Lower Manhattan, and we're in continual conversation with the city and some of the other consulting partners and agencies to make sure that when we think about that stack, we're consistent in how we think about it and we're getting best practices and latest information from them as well that we can apply to this project. 
Next slide. And before we get into the reaches themselves, you know, the, um, the authority and its project team began thinking about the various alignments that could be um, um, designed throughout the different reaches with a large toolkit of different types of interventions. There's, there's fixed interventions that are like flood barriers or structural berms or glass top flood barriers or buried flood members. And then there are deployable or mechanized systems where you have to either design something that automatically intervenes or is intervened by a person who activates something. And those are swing gates and slide gates and flip up gates, vertical sliding gates and stop logs. Clearly, project contains a mix of these. The more passive interventions, the fixed flood barriers are generally more reliable, um, but they generally have a greater urban impact. And the deployable barriers generally um, really mitigate the urban impact of what we're building, but require some type of intervention, intervention or probably some greater level of maintenance than the fixed flood barriers. And as we go through the project, we're trying to fit this toolkit into these different reaches, and that'll be part of the design process that we'll be soliciting feedback on as we go through the community engagement. Next slide. So now we're going to begin to address some of the, the questions that we've received at previous meetings. We're going to start off with sort of a list of general questions that we've received, and then we're going to get into the more specific reaches, but we'll start off with the general questions. Next slide. Oh, right. And, and before we get into that, I really wanted to highlight that the project has a, an alignment that's a preferred alignment, and we're continuing to look at alternative alignments. In this particular diagram, the purple is the preferred alignment, and the orange is the alternative alignment. And you can see that in a couple of reaches, the alternative alignment has you know, significant differences from the preferred. So, for example, in reach one, there's a fairly this is a very distinct, different alignment that we're studying, as well as the core alignment. In reach three, there are uh, there, there are some significant differences in the alignment. In reach five, for example, there's a very significant difference in the alignment between the alternative and the preferred. So we're continuing to look at these alternative alignments as we begin to study and get into more detail on our preferred alignments. And the more detail we get into the alignments, the more better we're able to ascertain and compare and answer the questions that the public has um, brought up as well as uh, the authority themselves. So, next slide. This is just the image of the purple, which is the preferred. Next slide. Okay, so now we get into the general project questions. So the first question, will this project raise taxes? I'm going to um, ask the authority to comment on that question. So is the authority going to speak or? Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm maybe, to maybe out when it makes sense to, because I know Tammy's hand is up. I have a couple of questions based on what you just said already. Okay. So I'm not sure when will be the time to break in with questions or not. Do you want to maybe um, step back a bit from that first question of raising taxes and then just talk about the questions that have been generated thus far and then we move into these? Does that work? Um. Yes, skip skip the financial one right now because that's going to take me a bit because I do have a question about that. So let's not, let's let's focus, maybe pick that up at the end. Okay, that's fine. Does that make and, sense, Timmy? Is there something that you want to say now? I, you know, I think that there's going to be a lot of questions that need to come, and it's very difficult to hold all questions to yeah. the end. I mean, for me personally, even looking at this, um, you know, my question instantly is where. If you go back to your timeline in the process, can the schedule be extended to add more engagement? And yeah. I say this not as a ding to the Battery Park City Authority, but you know, we had a meeting on alignment in September, and we're now in December. 
right? And we, the scoping process started alongside of the other process. And we quite frankly have not had the opportunity for a robust dialogue and engagement for the questions that were raised at that time. For example, Peter, on the alignment meeting, we were shown two alignments. Yeah. One, clearly no one wants because there's not a person in all of anything that I know of, unless it's that horrible horror movie wants a 10 foot wall built at the waterside. I mean, it was in places almost ridiculous and, and it's not a nice word to use and I apologize. It just, you know, it really isn't feasible. It's possible, but it's not really, it, it was a throwaway option. So what is really does seem to be presented is one really well thought through viable option and one that you can sweep out. And that led to many other questions that came up and I have the public, if I who am on the inside doesn't feel that there's been enough engagement and dialogue, I can't imagine somebody who's sitting in the attendee section who had not had the time to come in the September meeting feels about this yet. Right. You understand what I mean? And looking at everything. So my question is not, can the schedule be extended, but where in that lovely calendar that you put up are the fixed points. So if you start a scoping at X date, there are legal requirements for the last date can it be, but you don't have to start it necessarily on an EIS at that point. And those are the questions that we really want to know. Right. And so that would be a good question. Can we answer those questions now? Or is that not something that can be answered? And that's the first. And the other one was, um, we had a, a major question came up as to why environmental impacts for the moving of like the pier. If we're looking at a scoping hearing, why aren't sound and noise impacts being included on one of the largest, most egregious things that we have in this project that's outside your scope necessarily, but it is part of the project. Why are the environmental impacts on that not being considered as part of the project? So that last sentence again, why are the environmental impacts of what not being considered? Peter, as Peter knows what I'm talking about. Okay. It's about the moving of the pier north. Got it, yeah. got it. Yeah, well, I'm that's... sorry, this isn't explored down. So we have a lot of those questions in the section with the with the pier, which I believe is uh, yeah, one of the exactly. other reaches. I just, we, we absolutely 100% want to answer those questions. We really just want to get through the general questions as we had talked about previously to make sure that everything that has come in before tonight is addressed. And then we certainly have the ability to talk about the peer and the environmental considerations going forward. We but will. That's, that's certainly so, Tammy, let that's me say that. What about that's the it. general timeline, Nick? Because that's that's an issue. General timeline, we can we can where we can... in the printed schedule that you've shown the public can the schedule be adjusted to add in engagement opportunities? It's a great question. I don't know that we can answer it tonight unless somebody wants to jump in, but we do have the questions that we received already and we want to go through those to start. Put the link as you're doing this, Nick, which maybe it's in the chat already. I, I just didn't see. Is yep. the link to put it in the chat so people can go look because you you do you. answer every one of these questions. Yep. But I think people may have questions about the answers. So let's skip the That's project okay. raising yeah. taxes, not because I don't want to talk about it. I definitely want to talk about it, but let's talk about, um, and this is, I think is actually how will the schedule impact residents? That's what Tammy's talking about right now. That's her question. So that goes to, so Tammy, let, let's let them go through and let, but let's move it along. Cause we said 15 minutes and, and we're at 15 minutes. So let's move this along. Okay. So, but if I go too fast, please slow me down and, and, and. Uh, I can't see where people's hands are raised, so if, you know, if you just yeah, I will be calling on them. Don't interrupt. worry. You got it. All right. So, how will the schedule impact residents? Um, the product is just beginning design development. The scheduling, the phasing, and the staging are going to be developed during the design development itself. Design is anticipated to be approximately 19 to 26 months, followed by the construction period, and the construction is going to require partial and full closure of areas. Um, um, of the park 
and, and other areas they need to be used to install the flood barrier system. Um, and the uh, hardscaping and landscaping that will be put there will, of course, replace what's being disturbed. Um, there will be, in addition to that, there, there's going to be some minor field investigations that are going to take place during the design phase, such as geotechnical boring and other types of sampling and um, geophysical investigations that are relatively minor compared to the construction itself. But I guess the, the, the long story answer is we're going to be developing the details of this as we progress because we haven't yet done the design to figure out what the phasing and the scheduling is specifically going to look like. And as we get through those details, I'm sure we're going to be interacting with you folks and showing you those details and having conversations about them. Yeah, because the answer you just gave, Peter, is lovely high level, but it doesn't answer anything. It doesn't talk about the impacts, but you're saying you can't give us the impacts because we haven't decided yet what we're doing. Or you haven't decided yet what you're doing yet. So let's just go on to the next one. I'm moving you along. Right. Okay. Um, how is this impacted by the uh, the Army Corps um, HAT study? So the answer to that is, you know, the HAT study is still the the harbors and tributary study is still ongoing. Uh, the core project has the, the final design has not been selected, um, nor has funding been secured for that project. There's been a number of public presentations, which I'm, which I'm sure you're all aware of, and um, their preferred alternative, which is, I think, 3B, um, is expected to connect to the flood projects that the, the New York City has currently in various phases of design and construction around Lower Manhattan. So none of the projects that we're contemplating in Lower Manhattan are going to be made redundant by the Army Corps project if it gets funded and if it happens. I'm, I'm going to keep moving then, Justine, until you stop me, all right? Uh, yeah, keep going, because basically okay. what you just said there in English is to say that the Army Corps of Engineers is working on something, but Justine, what you're doing... Army okay, Corps, sorry. Army Corps is coming to environmental this month, so if people have Perfect. more questions, let's... They can ask about it. Yep. Okay, right. let's go to the next one. Perfect. Right. Um, is it possible to see a higher resolution and also a comparison of the current state versus future state? Um. Yes, and like I had said, you know, we're right now initiating design as we get into design. More detailed representation of the project is going to come forth, but right now what we're doing is we're showing basically renderings. That we've tried to make accessible to the public so that the public can imagine what we're thinking about as concepts for the alignments, but that doesn't necessarily represent any design work that's been done. You know, we haven't had people work on CAD do calculations just yet. They're beginning that right now. Okay, go ahead. That makes sense. Have the environmental designers, uh, architects, landscape designers, consultants, professionals that could face similar waterfront challenges such as in Holland? Yes, I will awkwardly provide the answer to this. Arcadis is a Dutch firm. Um, we've been doing this for 100 years in the Netherlands. We um, were the largest consulting engineer for the core post Katrina. And we've done the majority of the work in the New York area. So we are very experienced in the Dutch solutions, the solutions of natural systems and the technology that they use there. And we're trying to bring best practices from all areas of the globe to this project so that we are, are not missing a best practice that's being implemented elsewhere in the world. Don't do the lowest elevation on the west sides because that's going to be a reach six yes. and seven or something. So skip yeah. that and we'll go into it. Okay. How does this project? address the impact of drainage rainfill. Don't tell me how. Tell me yes or no, does it? And then let's move on. And then have that in the back of your mind as you're presenting each reach, how it impacts the drainage uh, uh, rainfall. Got the it. So the, answer, of, so the answer is yes, and even more specifically, yes, for what we consider um, DEP or city required rainfall requirements. And yes, the project is looking at extreme rainfall. The science of extreme rainfall is not as clear as what we are. Um, we have standardized with DEP's requirements, but we are evaluating what extreme rainfall looks like in the city, and that'll be part of the project. Okay, next slide, and then more general questions. Next slide. Um, when can we see details of the costs and how this work will be paid for? You're saying it's too early to do the costs, so skip that one. Okay. Can you talk about the trees being removed yet? Are you there yet? Are any of these things? Justine. Or what, what, Justine. Sorry. 
there I'm is trying a to watch them along. But there is a budget. He needs to be able to answer those questions. Financing is important. It is. I'm not. Yeah, there's yeah. a time and place. But okay, you can you answer me the budget? Yes or I'm no? Gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass that response. Can you hear me? Over to the authority. This is Gwen. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Gwen. Okay, we we had established an initial uh, project budget of six hundred and thirty one million dollars, uh, um, and um, we are, of course, that is uh, preliminary. We are waiting for some preliminary design concepts to be put together before we can refine that. But that's what we have um, been working with. Glenn. Okay. Question nine: How many tre trees will be removed? Um, we haven't dug into design yet, but we do recognize that trees will be impacted by the project. Um, the number of trees impacted is dependent on the specifics of the alignment and the buffer zone around the alignment and the interventions and the toolkit parts that we bring into the alignment. So we're very mindful that impacting trees is a very high criteria for this project, but we don't have the precise number of trees, and that's going to be um, more specifically calculated as we unveil the initial portions of our design. And as we finalize that design, those numbers will be more precise. Going because if ever, it, when you're coming to the point where it's going to be more precise, just keep going because you're really not giving us information we can opine on. Sure. Um, ten. How many um, BPC features will need to be removed? Um, the, the intent of the design is to integrate with the existing landscape and the features that are there, and moving or removing any public art or similar features will be done in conjunction with public input. We've already discussed some of the art pieces along what we refer to as Reach 6 and um, the ultimate disposition of those art projects. And so I think that's a dialogue that we're having with you folks right now, and we'll continue to be more specific in as we move forward with the project. But we recognize that there's a number of public art features and um, urban landscape features that we're looking to integrate. Uh, number 11, how many playgrounds will be removed or inaccessible for a number of years? So, you know, our response there is um, the current alignment maintains all the playgrounds, but the temporary construction impacts will be will, will have an impact on the programming of those playgrounds. And we're going to figure that out as we step into more detailed design, which then gets stepped into the phasing and the scheduling. And then we'll be able to answer that question um, more specifically. Uh, 12, what is. Why is building an inland wall around Battery Park City the best approach to um, fighting coastal flooding? So I think our response, if we understood this question correctly, is you know the the Northwest um, project was part of a larger Lower Manhattan project um, that reduces the risk of coastal flooding for the authority as well as for some of the inland communities. And the preliminary preferred alignment was selected after receiving public feedback. Um, um, and concerning multiple project requirements and constraints, you know, this, I think, gets back to um, the question we had before about West Street and the low line area there and the need to cross West Street and go into Tribeca as as a way to frame um, this element of the project to provide protection for Lower Manhattan. Are you going to address number 13, the height of the barriers in each reach? Yeah, we are going to have actually we have specific. So, based okay, so let's not talk area, about it now. Okay. Let's get to the reaches because it's a yeah. really important question, but let's talk about it per reach because everybody's going to ask you a question per reach. Totally. And what are alignments? How do you define this term? That that's a good question. Yeah, so, so, so the alignment, it's the physical path that the flood barrier system takes through the project area. Uh, and so we just refer to it as an alignment, but it's really it's, you know, it's the conceptual route. It's another way of saying that. That clear. Justine, you're on mute. Is there another slide for general questions? Thank you, Joe. No, we're going into the specifics at this point. I think we should start. Although anybody on the committee 
have a question at this point. I'm, I'm wanting to go into the reaches desperately. I see that we have questions from the audiences. I will let you speak and ask your question, Brittany first, and then Megan, unless yeah, no one on the committee. But I'm going to ask you to keep it Justine, to the. We're going to we're timing it also. Lucian yeah, has a timer. For okay, good. Both committee members and the public. And the public, that's fine. I want to keep it short, but I'm also going to say, if I interrupt you, Brittany or Megan, it's because I don't want to ask a question about a breach that's different than the one. I want to go into it and I want to do it piece by piece. Okay, so go ahead, Brittany, unmute yourself or whatever. And you've got, like, you know, ask your question and I'm two, minute. two minutes, two minutes to the question. For now, because we're really just getting started and then you're not, you certainly can speak again. Go ahead, Brittany, unmute. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, Brittany. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate um, you guys coming um, and doing this and hosting this session. Um, I guess I want to echo what Tammy said in terms of more opportunities for engagement and interactive engagement like this. Um, you know, also a, a common is I've been to all the open houses. I've been to the focus groups, the walks last year. And I'm still looking at this and not understanding exactly what I'm providing feedback on. Um, and, you know, to have a deadline of December 31st, um, I think a lot of people don't know there, you know, needs to be signage, there needs to be outreach going out, asking for it. Um, but also when you're asking for the feedback, it needs to be understandable and the and the lines. Um, aren't totally decipherable to to the average person, unfortunately. So it needs to have some renderings alongside, which I hope is going to happen today. Um, you know, to to be able to give people an opportunity to understand it and to have you know feedback incorporated and then adjusted and then see it again, right? Like there's some feedback that was provided during the open houses in the past that I still see not incorporated in some of these flood alignments, like the duck pond, like not rebuilding the whole playground again. Um, Let's go to it because we're going to talk. And Brittany, each one. Brittany, I'm interrupting yep. you because we're going to talk about each one of those things as we get to yep. the reach. So, so patience. Yep. Do you yes. have a question yes. that needs an answer or are you just making a comment? I'm making a comment. Um, okay. And then but please yep, keep listening. I, I make and then um, my, my, my question is, um, if we can have the exact design principles for the project shared and then have each different alternative mapped against those design principles and how they fare um, against the design principles, I think that will really help. That is a really important point. Thank you. Okay, so did you hear that, Peter? And did you hear that the um, BPCA team having an idea and a clear cut expectation of what or, or information about what you're building to and why is helpful? And if Brittany's asking, it's not clear to her. So if you think you've said it already, it's not clear to her. Thank you, Brittany. I see Jeff's hand is raised. Megan, I'm going to come to you after Jeff. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, because this is uh, confusing. Uh, clarify for everyone make sure that I get it right, is that the purpose of the comments that are due on December 31st is to help define the scope of the environmental impact statement. Basically, the draft scoping document that we are commenting on proposes a scope for the environmental review. But it indicates the things that will be studied and the things that won't be studied. So the comments that we're making by December 31st that we're taking away from tonight's meeting are comments on the scope. There will be plenty of opportunity to comment on the design itself. There, there is no design really to comment on right now other than sort of general concepts. And although it's important and per, people are certainly, um, um, you know, permitted to comment on design or anything they want to comment on by December 31st, what the deadline is for is commenting on the scope document, commenting on what we want the environmental review process to look at. Uh, and that's so 
So people shouldn't be concerned that we're running out of time on December 31st. We need to know all these details they don't currently know. That's not what the deadline is for. The deadline is simply to comment on the scope of the environmental review. And Lucian, you put in the link. I know we've done it before, but there is a link to the environmental review draft scoping draft scoping document. And in there, and I think we talked about it a little bit at that at the there at the um hearing meeting where that were was discussed and we had some questions that we were asking about it and there were things that we identified but as we go through each reach it's going to be really important to, to point out questions that come to mind per reach again not to say how many trees will there be planted we don't know yet we're not there that's design the concept is going to be how much green space do we have or perhaps in the environmental impact statement we want green space to be maximized and we want that to be considered. I mean, that that might be a, a statement that we'll put in there, but I'm stopping talking now. Just, and, Justine, um, yeah, um, after, after we, we go to Megan, perhaps I can switch over and just show the committee and all of our attendees what sorts of items must be studied per the law yes. and Thank what you. we are essentially adding on top of where we're, yes. we're not subtracting, we're only adding additional things to be studied for the EIS. So that would be um, so helpful. Okay. Well, wonderful. And, and uh, Gwen or Nick, let me know if that's somewhere in here and if we shouldn't do that little pivot, but uh, now I'll uh, unmute Megan. Thank you. Go ahead, Megan speak. You're unmuted Megan. If you're there, speak. Megan should be able to just talk. Yeah, her mic is open. Yeah, her mic is open. I can see it. Um, maybe if you have headphones in, Megan, maybe take the sorry, headphones I'm off speaking. and just can you, can now you hear me. Now. You. I'm now very sorry. My my computer was uh messing with me. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. I, um, thanks, Justine, for um, for having this and and for all of your great questions. Um, I, I wanted to echo again what Tammy and Brittany said about you know having more opportunity for engagement and questions from the public to provide feedback. Um, my question is uh, though, um, and it's general um, uh, on all the reaches. Have you considered um, less invasive nature based alternatives um, to to building these, you know, cement and steel walls um, alternatives that would pri prioritize protecting green spaces, mature trees, biodiversity, etc. Um, you know, such as restoring and extending wetlands, planting living shorelines, building bioswales, um, you know, using trees, planting rain gardens, etc. Um, have any of these holistic approaches been considered um, as an alternative? Yes, we have. Um, the, uh, I would say that the design team is very familiar with um, those natural solutions. Um, a lot of the natural systems approaches have come from the Netherlands. And uh, Arcadis is the designer for the Oligan Breakwaters project along with SCAPE, our partner here on the team. So we're very, very familiar with those types of solutions. Um, right now within the authority, we don't see that those solutions would provide the performance necessary to meet the flooding criteria that we've laid out and that FEMA has laid out for the purpose of certifying the reaches. But we Is are that, constantly- have there, I'm sorry, have, have there been like um, studies done comparing the two um, alternatives? And and showing you know exactly how much um, these alternative solutions, bio um, uh, nature based solutions, could do. We or haven't. Done, is there yeah, we haven't. Done, showing you? Well, we haven't done an explicit study, but um, our experience, um, which hmm. covers many projects, is that those nature based solutions are not going to provide the performance that would require. Um, that would be required for FEMA certification. Um, ha having said that, the project team is looking extensively at opportunities within the reaches to enhance ecology, and we'll get to that when we talk about reach seven, when we talk about reach three. So maybe we can dip more into that subject when we get into those reaches. Sure, okay. um, I would request a study if that's possible to enter into the record. Um, I'm making a note, we'll see. 
Hey, and, uh, Peter, Peter, perhaps you can it, maybe just touch on very, very briefly how the, the, the conditions um, around the project area uh, could, could yeah, may constrain the ability to um, pursue some of the, the nature based solutions that might otherwise be available in other locations. That yes. that's what I was going to ask. Actually, was detailed. You're saying it's not possible, but why? So thank you. Yeah. So like for example, uh, for the Living Breakwater Project that we did for Staten Island, what you're doing there is you're changing the topography of the seabed to create mm -hmm. uh, something that impacts the hydrodynamics of the waves. That's possible off the coast of Staten Island, but here, once you get past the relieving platforms of the authority. The topography of the seabed drops very significantly, and it, to be frank, it'd be an extremely significant intervention to create a living breakwater outside of this project. So technically, there's a significant amount of challenges. Two, it's not; it's it's in it's beyond the pier line of um, the authority's authority, and so we would be very unlikely to get any kind of regulatory approval for that because that's a navigational area um and so those are a couple of examples where where we think an, an intervention like that uh, doesn't make sense because of the engineering considerations of this project versus that project it's also true that oftentimes you know living shorelines while they provide some type of dampening effect when it comes to wave attenuation it doesn't hold back surge and we're really primarily concerned about surge and wave attenuation here and wave you know wave interactions with our structures. And so that doesn't provide again the performance that we're looking for to protect the community and the lower Manhattan area. Which is why in the other products in Lower Manhattan, such as the East Side, such as the Battery Park, we're even studying natural systems for the FIDA area. Those choices aren't being made because we don't have the authority to go into the water to make those interventions. And the way the ocean bed is contoured off the shoreline of Manhattan doesn't allow for those choices to be made. Okay, I hope that was responsive. It seemed to me to be, but um, thank you. Um, I see Victoria Fiorello also has her hand raised. Let's ask, let's get her as the last question on the general questions, and then we'll start with each one. But go ahead, um, un unmute Victoria. Uh, hi there. Hi, Justine. Thanks so much for hosting. Um, thank you Peter, for being here. I just wanted to. Um, to follow up on what uh, Megan and Gwen were saying, um, you know, the request for a study is great. And just to say that, you know, when we hear things such as this just can't be done, it is very helpful to be given an explanation. People here certainly are much smarter than I am and do understand a lot of these logistics. And so it is helpful to know, but it'd be great to have something in writing from the, from the Battery Park City Authority that tells us the reasons why certain plans have not been uh, pursued. Thanks, Victoria. That's helpful because then it's something to go back to. Um, okay, Marianne, I'm going to call on you because I don't want to stop calling on people, but you're the last one and I'm not going to call on anybody else until we go through each one. Go ahead, Marianne. My comment is we don't live in a natural area. This was an old man made and I could we don't have a natural shoreline to put in swamplands and bioswales and so on. And, and we want to maximize the, the land for human use. So is that a reason why these things don't work here? Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. But that's certainly a design consideration. Uh, you know, like we're using wetlands, for example, in South Nassau County as wave attenuation for some of our projects, but it's also because they have the Western Bays region there and it's a wetlands region, right? It's the state's third largest wetlands region. So really the challenge in South Nassau County and Jamaica Bay is to enhance the wetlands and to have them um, reconstitute themselves so that they can provide some wave dampening effect. But you're right. I mean, this, this particular project is a, it's a, it's a human made project that doesn't have those ecologies around it. And so we really can't restore the performance of what was there. And that's part of the consideration as well. All right, thank you. Um, let's move to reach one. 
Justine, really quick, I'm going to oh, pull right, up right. the scope document. Thing. Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, then, yes. Yep, yeah, I'm going to go to, I believe it's 4.4. Four. Section 4.4. Four. Just give me a second. Messed it up. I think it's, it's a 4.6. 4. 4.6. 4. Yes, here we are. Okay, everyone. So, uh, Gwen, I have here the uh, scope of work for the EIS. This is everything that's canned uh, and and, and pre-contemplated by by the law. Did you want to go over these? Thanks, Lucian. Um, <clears throat> we have Bob White from AKRF on, um, who uh, is handling the EIS. Bob, um, could you do a very um, quick review of the of the 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 categories um, of um, study and analysis so that people have an idea of what we're talking about uh, with respect to the scope of work. Is Bob on? Bob is here. He's got to unmute un un uh, mute him. Is it Bob White? Robert yes. White? Robert White is, is on. He's okay. a... Yep. They, it, he just has to unmute himself. But in it, uh, while he's unmuting himself, I have a question, Lucian. If you scroll uh, back to the beginning of it, where it says description of proposed project, and then four 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 point four says reasonable alternatives to the project, and four point four point one, uh, no action alternative, and then the inter alternative alignments. I mean, that would be a space in which to address the questions that. Um, Megan and uh, Marianne were bringing up, I think, a little bit, huh? And and Brittany too, just about the alternative a lot. It's not that far back, not that far back. It was just, it was just like one page up. Yeah, keep going. You want to go to four? We were, you were in four. <clears throat> okay, freeze. Now go up a little bit. Okay, there, that right there, and I'm just I'm wondering if that's not where those I issues could come in and and be addressed. So if you make a note of that again, and that maybe it's not the right place, but that would be something where the actual environmental impact statement addresses the concerns raised, because I thought those were really good good, good things. Wetlands is great, uh, natural based solutions, wonderful, but if the env environmental impact study or whatever says. No, it's not feasible because we built out so far, whatever they're going to say. I don't know, but they raised good questions and they deserve. Clear cut reasons why they're not an alternative. If, in fact, they're not an alternative, or if they are an alternative and are chosen. Not to be done for other reasons that needs to be explained, but let's go down to the scope of work for the EIS. Which is looks like Robert White's unmuted. Okay, let's go. Um, Mr. White, please. Thank you for being here and take it away. Sure thing. Um, good evening, everyone. Had a little trouble unmuting myself, or maybe someone unmuted me. But um, <laughs> um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just drill down on the scope and give you a step by step of what the you know the scope contains, and then ultimately what the you know as the guide book, if you will, for the EIS. Um, so we we uh, we've kind of broken the scope into two parts. Um, and I don't have control of this, uh, uh, but I think the part we're in now is is the elements of uh, what would otherwise be in an EIS that might be for a commercial or a residential project that wouldn't apply to this project because we don't have population, we don't generate students, and we don't generate uh, uh, traffic from a wall. So there's certain components of a seeker analysis that have screened out. So if we can scroll down, I'll go through the parts of the scope that are really germane to a uh, to this environmental impact statement. So yeah, we're scrolling down. I guess I guess I want to like interrupt you already. Go back sure. up, Lucian, because um, in terms of, this is something that I noticed when we had the other meeting. So community facilities and services, I don't know that it's not going to impact us. I don't know that there's not going to be a displacement of businesses because some of the stuff that you're looking to do in the regatta, there's businesses there. If you're looking to do things in in uh, by Gateway Plaza, there's a restaurant that's right on the water. I'm not sure, you know, and we 
these are things to talk about, but I, I, I think okay. I take, uh, um, I question saying that there's nothing to look at. There is, there is something to fair, look at. Fair enough. We can take that comment and look at it in terms of the, the project and look at it. And it was a draft scope of work. Yep. And we get comments like this that make us look a little more closely at, at uh, analyses like you just mentioned, and we can uh, work together to decide if that would go into the final scope of work. Perfect, because yes, but now go ahead, go to where you want to go, but I'm going to point out to you that open space is a thing. Yeah, Shadow open space might be a also, thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, go ahead, it's okay. You know, I, I don't... No, this, is, this is exactly the kind of input we're wanting to get. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, on shadows, uh, the, the normal sort of structural height for a shadow analysis for us for a for an EIS, uh, at least according to the city seeker technical manual is 50 feet. We weren't going to do a shadow analysis for this project because of the, the, the height is well below that, that there wouldn't be a shadow from from the structures that would create uh, an impact, uh, you know, in accordance with the seeker technical manual. Um, yeah, uh, so, I mean, I, go ahead. I'll, I'll but, bring it up per reach, so, but go ahead. Sure. Maybe, uh, maybe, Bob, it'd be important to, to clarify that there are maybe there are certain things that we have made a preliminary determination of it that, that, that are screened out topics that are screened out. And what I think Justine is pointing out is that these are the kinds of things that, um, the, the community wants to, to understand, um, because in certain instances, they may suggest that perhaps that particular topic shouldn't be screened out and should be yes. further analyzed. Correct. Um, yeah. So, and I would encourage the, the board to submit that with your letter. That's why, you know, I I think that's one of the major reasons we're here, right? Um, so if you, you can let us know your your uh, opinion on that, we can look at the secret technical panel, look at the project. And look at our scope and see if it needs to be amended to address your comment. That makes that makes sense. Thank you. I I kept interrupting you. So if there was no, something, that's okay. that's, that's if you specifically fine. wanted to go someplace, just here, I'm going to mute you if you're not careful. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're right. Um, I mean, what we're doing is great. So I'm happy to take it more slowly. Um, but uh, in terms of you know. Uh, air quality, noise, and vibration, just so it's not, you know, we will do that analysis for the construction, and that's later in the scope of work, but a wall and a flood protection system being a static system, it, you know, there's, there's no air emissions or noise or vibration emissions uh, or vibration uh, once the uh, once the system is in place. So what we're looking at now is 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 what we screened out as, as sort of the the impacts of the project once it's installed, but not for the not for the construction duration. And you'll see later on there's a whole uh, subsection in this scope that addresses um, construction period impacts. Um, so if whoever has control, if you can scroll down. So these are the these are the elements of the scope where we are going to do a deeper dive and um, and detailed analyses. Uh, land use changes in land use, and one of the bigger uh, parts of this, I think, will be the uh, the waterfront revitalization program that the city has in place. Consistency with other plans and programs for Lower Manhattan, like Peter was just talking about. So I think that'll be a big chapter for us. Archaeological resources and historic resources they were both present in the in the um, study area and along the project alignment. So there'll be a detailed analysis on those two technical areas. Um, continue down, please. Um, urban design and visual is going to be a huge chapter for us because of the changes in the context of the uh, that that uh, would come along with, you know, physical changes along the along the alignment. So we want to make sure that we analyze any changes or effects as it relates to view corridors, uh, shapes and forms of the street. Uh, sidewalks. Um, so I think I heard a little bit about that earlier. So that's a big chapter for us in this uh, analysis. Natural resources. Principal focus here is our uh, Hudson River and how uh, there there may be effects on the river in terms of piles or any filling that may be necessary to support the structure. Um, hazardous materials. 
is going to look at the historical um, uses along uh, along the corridor and determine what uh, testing or soil remediation is necessary to install the project to install the uh, to install the flood protection system. Next, next slide, please, or next page. Um, we'll keep going, Dan. Please, if you have a question, please let us, let us know because this is the essence question. of this scoping the process. What's the difference between um, the, the dotted line down? and the solid line, yeah. Robert? In the pictures that were above the. Oh, the, the, oh yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to, if someone uh, can just step back to that graphic. Give us the legend at the bottom. Okay. I got it. Never mind. Right, Keep yeah. Going. Yeah, the, the cross hatching is the like project area is like the focus in terms of where the um, within that cross hatching is where the uh, flood protection system would be aligned, where construction activities might generate noise, where there might be contractors working, and there would be you know some grading activity and landscaping. So that's what the cross hatching is, and the dotted line is the study area. Okay. Water and sewer infrastructure. Um, this is really related to the interior drainage um, because the system doesn't generate uh, a water demand or, a, or a, um, you know, a sewage demand. It may require some relocation of lines in order to be installed, but it's not going to have a generation aspect to it. Um, but part of the project is also going to analyze what the effects are of the dual kind of tidal flood with the rain event flood. And that will be an analysis that we will include in the in the environmental impact statement. And I think I've heard uh, in, in prior discussions uh, that is a concern. So that will be in the EIS. Um, transportation. Um, like I said before, you know, the system doesn't generate trips. But the system will uh, be installed along sidewalks and within pedestrian pads or aligned along sidewalks where it might uh, uh, consume a portion of a sidewalk or, at a, or, or you know, what is otherwise open to the public for, um, um, for pedestrian movements. So I know we want to be very careful about that because that in lower Manhattan, we have a lot of walkers and DOT has um, a lot of standards for how to analyze the effects of structural systems and sidewalks. So we're going to do this to DOT standards and analyze how the proposed flood protection system might affect street use, sidewalk use, I should say. Uh, greenhouse gas and climate change, again, not, not an emitter sort of uh, during the operational phase, but we are going to look at the, uh, the materials and the installation and how it would comply with the city, state, federal um, obligations with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. So these graphics are just showing you where all the soil and groundwater uh, testing locations are proposed. Neighborhood character, um, for those who have read, you know, EIS is sort of as an amalgam. It puts together all these elements that create your neighborhood in terms of open space and land use and community facilities and looks at the effects collectively of the proposed project on, on a neighborhood and its character and its defining features. Um, and then our sort of probably one of our more intensive uh, chapters is going to be construction because it's, it's, a, it's a large construction project. It's near, nearly $600 million of investment and a lot of construction. So um, we're going to do a detailed dive on the truck trips. It, it, it comes down to how, how long and how many workers and how many trips and how much noise, right? So, um, and how open space may be uh, need to be closed. I heard the open space question earlier and how long might a might a uh, open space or a play area need to be closed uh, while while the system is being installed? And can't you know we can't answer that question tonight, but that will be in the EIS, and we'll be working with the the Turner team to develop uh, details on 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 these very elements that we're about to go through here. So 
Um, Justine, this is Gwen. Does this, this give us a, enough of a context to kind of proceed into the reaches yes. now? I think so. I think we should move forward. Thank you so much. Now, this gives us a clear understanding and it shows everybody where to look as we're discussing this after. Let's start going with the reaches because I know people have questions about them. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So who's taking this one? Reach one. So reach one. So let's um, reach one is the reach on the northern part of the project. And let's go into the next couple of slides. Next slide. So we have these three questions. So Justine, I was going to read these questions and then we'll go into the visual stay answer the questions if that's okay. And, and then we can always go yeah, back. to. Yeah, just, yes, say. that's fair. And then let's go. Yes, read all three questions and then start talking in the visuals. Yep. So how would the project impact pedestrian use on North Moore Street? Um, and if modeling will not allow for reach 1B, could this imp be improved by putting the barrier between the bike path and the West Side Highway rather than between the pedestrian and the bike paths? And then the third is, um, can you describe um, more how this would impact Washington Market and the park up there, um, especially their construction um, uh, and, and the closure of the green space along Battery Park? Where the parents and little kids are supposed to go during construction. Okay, so next slide. So what we prepared is, um, oh, there's a couple of bonus questions uh, that are we've received. Um, I don't understand reach one. Need better visuals, and more to opine on. And the images are too low in resolution. Please post high resolution files. So the following set of slides is what we've created to respond to these questions and to drill down more detail into reach one. So this is the existing shot of reach one. Next slide. This is the, the, the expanded view of the preliminarily proposed project showing the alignment along North Moore, the alignment how it crosses West Street and how it goes along there on the west side of West Street and ties into reach two. You can see the heights there are the heights that were um, um, we're trying to communicate the height as experienced by an average person walking by it as opposed to like a design height based upon Nav 88. So you can see the interventions there, like on North Moore, for example, on the west side of North Moore, it's five feet as it goes up the street, it tapers. At some points, it's, it's, it's as low as it's low as a foot. You can see along West Street, the interventions there are seven and a half feet, and then a little bit further down, nine and a half feet. If we go to the next slide, we can have a blow up of this. Right, so this is North Moore. So if the first question was, how is this gonna impact the pedestrians along North Moore Street? It's a great question. We're gonna look at that during design. What we know is that this is a sidewalk, you know, we have a curb, we have a sidewalk, and we have building facades and building elements. And what we've gotta to try to do is stitch together uh, an alignment up that um, sidewalk that is sensitive to the building facade and building elements, and also recognizes that the height of the wall tapers as you go up the street and starts off at around five-ish feet and goes to as little as one foot up to the top of the street. So that's something that we're gonna explore during design. And that, as an example, is definitely gonna be a moment when we're gonna have those details developed in concept, and then we're gonna come and we're gonna have a community meeting about it. And we're gonna get community feedback on what that looks like, how that's being experienced, and, and we're gonna get the feedback on the more detailed design choices that we're making as we go up North Moore Street. So does that answer question one? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, the biggest question I have is that five feet figure, is yep. it five additional feet? No, no, that's five feet off the current grade. So like the person standing there is like the person standing on like the current street right now. So current, this will be an additional five feet for so and Tammy, go ahead. You can ask the question, but that 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 was. My biggest thing is, I don't understand if. This is five feet on top of what's there, and it seems like the answer is yes, it's five feet on top of what's there it or. Is. It is yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, correct. Tammy, go ahead. You want to ask a question now or you want to wait till the end. What kind of outreach has been done? Can you detail that in each reach? So that the people of who live on North Moore or work over there have been able to opine and comment on the scope. And at each reach outreach answers should be able to be, you know, what kind of engagement has been done with the partners on those levels. 
right? I mean, Tammy, the the you know the schedule that we had shown on there earlier shows outreach events occurring as the design details are developed because what we're trying to do is have a productive conversation with those stakeholders and show them choices as opposed to show them concepts. I think we've we've seen that sometimes when you show someone a concept like we have, we don't give people enough information to weigh in on a choice. And so I think we're looking to accelerate those design developments so that we can get those set of choices so that we can go to the stakeholders along with more and then present them with those choices. But I, I want to invite Gwen to comment on that schedule as well. Gwen, did you want to say anything here? Uh, sure, and <clears throat> you know, this is part of the, the project area that was previously part of the North um, BPC um, uh, resiliency project. Um, so there were there was uh, outreach with these property owners here in Defense Plaza, BMC, uh, C, um, and that is continuing um, in the in the manner that that Peter described. Um, I don't know Claudia if you or Nick have any more detailed information uh, about that at this point about specific meetings, but uh, I know that's actively being um, advanced. That is a conversation I want to make sure that happens because in our outreach with the trust, I know that they are going to opine, but they did not feel that they had enough robust dialogue and members of the advisory committee um, were unaware, although we did share all the information with them for this evening. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks, Tammy and thanks, Gwen. Uh, Let's um, Lucian, can you move Ashma over? She's one of our newer board members. Oh, I could perfect. Yes. And so, and Wendy, go ahead. Yeah, because you got a question about this particularly, right? Yeah, I think that um, uh, all your comments are really good. I think that just to clarify, it's going from Greenwich Street, you know, to West Street, and it's and the wall will get larger as we're going down. It most of it will be against the building, but I think in terms of um, my thoughts on this is that I go back to signage and visualization and. It, when we're reaching out to BMCC or IPN, which these are the buildings that are impacted, is there any way that we can put, I don't know, a chalk line is not the appropriate thing, but something like that up on the, in the physical space, um, which will prompt the neighborhood to say, oh, what's going on? Um, I know that's not normal. That's not what people do, but I just think that it would, it would really engage the public a lot earlier if we could actually have some sort of, you know, line on a wall earlier on with a sign to say, you know, this is coming. So it's just, um, it's just a wish. It's a great idea. I mean, they did that with the blue paint let, on the- Let them answer. Just yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, that's something we can certainly consider, particularly in this stretch where the, um, where we're, where we're dealing with um, very small scale, and scale matters, right? So, you know, going up the block as it tapers down and goes from five feet to one feet, how the people in those buildings experience that elevation and where that falls along the sidewalk, that's something we should certainly consider. Right, especially what I'm also thinking is that um, right now it's a, a fence where the, I guess the mm -hmm. back lot parking lot is. Yes, that's um, right. That's a great place to hang a sign because it is going to be pretty high there. It's basically going to be as tall as the fence when we did that walkabout um you know gosh the walkabout was like a year ago or something like that um but that was very helpful to see how the slope of that street is actually pretty intense it um, is. Right. Yeah. and and i just think that for those of us who have walked it and seen it and you know it's one thing to think of it's only like a foot on the corner on on greenwich and and um north Moore, but when you're on that you know back lot parking lot where the right now it's an open fence that's great signage and it's quite frankly, you know, no man's land in many ways back there. Um, I think you could actually have a, you know, a robust education of the neighborhood, um, you know, and you could also send people from the website down here to say, you know, go down there and stand and have a visual, you know, sense of what will happen and also explaining what 30 inches means in sea level rise by 2050 for that particular spot. I just think that for those of us who were there, remember all the sticks 
I don't know if you were there, but, you know, with all those different sticks and we had that, it, it was just, it was kind of mind blowing um, for me personally. So, you know, I just, the, you know, the more things that can be physical, uh, people can understand that way. Great suggestion. Okay, so that's question one. Let's go to question two, unless anybody else has any comments. No, that was perfect. I don't see any other hands. Thank you, Wendy. That was a great point. Okay. Um, Christine, you have two hands. Dan I do Wolf have two hands, Paul. Dan and Paul. Now I'm seeing them in the bottom. Um, let's talk about, yeah, let's go with that reach. So let's, let's let that, uh, let's go back a slide and let's unmute Dan and then Paul. Dan, you, you're unmuted. This is Dan. So the, the wall uh, along between West Street and what's currently the walking and bike path will be consistently around seven feet high. Is that the correct? That's the next, that's, that's, in the, in the next that's slide. The next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hold your question. You can even keep yourself unmuted. But um, Paul, do you have a question about about uh, North Moore Street? With regard to the slide on North Moore Street and the one that's on screen right now, that is. Go ahead. Go to the North. Ask your North Moore Street question, and then we'll go. And I'll, sure. I'll keep you guys. So go the, ahead. So where that where the in the right hand uh, right hand uh, illustration there, there are several gaps in in the fence line, uh, and uh, especially uh, down where the uh, where the car park is. Mm -hmm. What happens there? Uh, are there going to be mobile barriers or something or raising barriers? Because if water comes in up to that height, it's just going to find the open spot and flood in. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. No, as, as we get into design development on that alignment, we're going to apply the different types of interventions in the toolkit that I talked about yeah. earlier. Yep. Um, and whether it's a mechanized system, something sliding, something that's automated, something that flips up, you know, um, North Moore Street is a great opportunity for interventions like that, that, like I said, are not visible or have an impact on urban fabric when they're not in use. And so we'll be exploring their usage along that street. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. And let's hold on to the next slide thing. Let's, let's talk about it and then I will call on you guys first. Thank you. So keep your hand up, Paul, because I'll forget. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. But as, as we go down um, 9A, um, we, we, uh, we move the alignment down alongside BMCC, and then we cut across uh, 9A, and we provide for each of those um, roadbeds uh, barriers, and then we then cut down on the west side of 9A and we link into the beginning of our reach too. Now, one of the questions um, was about uh, the pedestrian bike paths and where the alignment specifically was gonna be along the west side of 9A. And I think the response to that is, we're looking very carefully at that, recognizing the sensitivity of that area. And we're looking specifically at, at where the alignment is. We're looking at what types of deployables could be used along that area to minimize the visual impact. And so there's a lot of discussion within the design team of what we can do there. I would say the details of those choices are not ready yet because they haven't been developed. But once those choices get developed, again, there's going to be a robust community meeting about that particular alignment stretch and how the how that alignment interacts with the park, with 9A, with the open spaces around it, and how it intersects with the turn as you turn into the relieving platform in Reach 2. Next I'm going to hold. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. I see Dan and Paul have a question and yep. um, Tammy has a question. So I'm going to let Tammy go first and then Dan and Paul and I'm going to hold my question because maybe someone's going to ask it for me. Oh, Tammy's your hand up. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Go ahead. Tammy. My question is really about the um, integration with the air, the light and the shade and the dialogues that you've had with BMCC. For moving along West Street. Now, your preliminary proposal is north of Harrison Street. Yeah. Does that mean that there'll be nothing along the exterior of BMCC going down West Street until you get two chambers? Yes, that's the current proposal. Yes. But, you know, Tammy, I just want to point out that 
as we get into the design, one of the things that we recognize is that there's, there's some pretty significant utility issues underneath and around BMCC. You know, we're, we're gathering, we have most of that information right now. And as we get into the design, um, we're going to have to really wrestle with those utility issues. And that may affect some decisions on that alignment and where it sits in the sidewalk. So that's just uh, something that we'll be exploring during design. When you say where it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Taylor. Where it sits in the sidewalk because of the existing utilities and because of what runs underground. I understand that. But I also, you know, do think it gives us an opportunity to take a look at the um, evacuation routes and mm -hmm. to see how to better strengthen the infrastructure and utilities at the same time. Yep. So we don't have the situation that we've had in other areas where things get ripped up and put back and ripped up and put back because there's been no coordination of updating between different agencies. Could we put that somehow? And that's a question for Lucian and and not to that answer should go to in you the guys. That yeah, should go in yeah. The we, yeah, exactly. I'm going to say so. Lucian, make a note of that, please. Um, and then, I'm sorry to interrupt, but especially with BMCC, because I've seen more than one press story about possibly, you know, BMCC being sold and redeveloped. Because when we did build schools, now that is the largest parcel of land that actually has huge unused airspace above it. Um, mm -hmm. It is an incredibly valuable piece of land and it's actually somehow JP Morgan is on something when you look up who owns the land and how it's, uh, you know, BMCC, their help, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I just feel like whoever the development people are with BMCC, I just would like to make a special request that they are directly asked, are you planning on, you know, redoing this building? Because it would be a shame if they're going to knock it down the building and you're putting all this in. Just that, that's a good, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. And then, and I guess my question is, so preliminary proposed, you've got it along BMCC. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just they do not. I don't understand. They, they do not. What you're looking at is North Moore. I, you're no, no, looking no, no, at no, no, Harrison. No. That's Harrison. And they are crossing it onto right. the west side of West Street. The first proposals that they showed us. Um, 2019 had them along BMCC. Oh, all the way along BMCC. No, no, what I'm saying is north of here. The question is, why are we not just stay? And then the answer may be what you said about infrastructure. And I just want to make sure why are we not staying along uh, the bike path or along the west side highway on the west side? Uh, yeah, west side. Yeah, that's a good question. We did look at that. Um, we thought that this was the most efficient way of crossing 9A. I think the crossing of 9A also has some infrastructure beneath that our, 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 uh, that, that are constraints from a design perspective, but we can follow up with you on that and give you more specifics yeah. why we're crossing there versus crossing a little bit more south. Okay, and then I see we've got Dan Wolf, Paul, and Brittany Ernst in the um, attendee section. So Dan, now you can ask your question. Sorry, and thank you for your patience. Solution on mute, Dan. Oh, that, uh, on mute. There you go. Go ahead, Dan. We hear you. Oh, you were. How about now? Yeah. Go no, ahead. I think my question was addressed. I was asking if there's an engineering reason to cross at Harrison versus continuing down what seems like a relatively unused stretch of barren sidewalk on the east side of the street. Um, but I, I think that was partially okay. or, or almost completely answered so thank you thank you paul yeah mine was similar uh, i noticed that i was going to ask about the crossing of uh, west street as well but i think the previous answer with respect to to uh, multiple interventions uh, answers that one thing that i would ask about this particular slide though again looking at the right hand depiction the barrier position appears to run down the middle of the sidewalk um, and my concern would be that that either narrows the sidewalk or creates a, a you know sort of a seven foot high tunnel um, yeah. down which people would have to try and walk um, can the wall or the barrier not be integrated with the actual wall of the bmcc structure itself uh, and, and narrow that space yeah that's a great point and, and i think that 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 speaks to what we're doing here sort of in the big picture, you know, we're presenting diagrams of the alignment without having done the design. 
So we've made some assumptions on where things are going to be just so that we can visualize them and show a representation. But as we get into the design, we're going to look at the utility constraints or we're going to look at the facade of the building. We're going to do all those different types of analyses and come up with a more accurate depiction of what it's going to be and then represent that in a visual. This is this is really um, um, meant to not be a design drawing, but a visualization of the concept alignment. So and it's a great point. Obviously, the intervention and its impact on the pedestrian flow on the east side of 9A is going to have to be factored in. Okay. And, we, and to build on that, that has to go in our resolution about the concerns for um, the tunnel, the, the tunnel effect. The right? tunneling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The tunneling effect, the lack of trees, because trees will definitely need to be removed to get this done. Um, yeah. And the fact that although they may not be aware, the city is currently looking at dedicating an additional lane off of 9 to bicycle traffic, which has not been included in this dialogue thus far. Thus far, yeah. On the west side, correct? Or on both sides? It's no point to saying any side at this point. It's just it has to be in the considerations of the uh, scope. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm also going to want to move things along. So, Brit so Brittany, I'm going to call on you, certainly. Um, and I also, before Brittany goes, uh, I'll mute her, but before she goes, I, I don't know if I prefer having, you know, when I said, you know, why did you move it to BMCC after uh, north of Harrison Street? I don't know where I prefer it. And I just, I guess I'd like to know what the environmental impact would be on either side, but go ahead, Brittany, you speak. Thanks so much. Um, a, a few things is, um, number one, when you wall this off, what happens to the water in the north? of this, you know, and I think someone mentioned on the pooling effect, um, you know, there, it seems like that they would be worse off um, further north um, under this, you know, um, arrangement. Um, and then the other thing is, is, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out why the Battery Park City Authority is doing this piece outside of the jurisdiction, kind of similar to, you know, the, um, the South. Um, especially if, as I see in the scoping document, that there's no plans to apply for federal funding, which makes no sense to me as well. We definitely should be applying for um, other types of funding, federal funding, um, as well as other state funding. Um, and the concern to me is is in a in a scenario of an emergency where we have a hurricane, a storm surge coming, we're blocking off a major thoroughfare of traffic or escape route to people. And that just seems to, to be incredibly counteractive, you know, um, doesn't make counter sense. Counter yeah, counter, yeah. thank you very much. I appreciate that, the, you fixing my uh, words, but it, but it, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. And I think at a past um, environmental committee meeting, um, there was a there was a woman on there that was talking about how part of the reason why you can't do it through the median was because of um, um, the drainage and you know there's a lot of sewage systems through there which have to be replaced anyways and so you know maybe that it won't work with what is existing but there are plans to uplift the sewage and systems and if we're going to go on you know do this and do it right. It's the combined sewer overflow, which is different than sewage. It's actually like the major, major pipe. Yeah. Um, yeah underneath the median is the is what's what's referred to as the interceptor. It's sort of uh -huh. like a it's, it's sort of like a ring pipe that goes around Lower Manhattan and conveys all the water up to the west when it gets pumped. So it's a it's a fairly significant piece of sewage infrastructure. So okay. okay. So, so I have a question. Is that a scoping thing or is that a design question? Is that a scoping issue or a de design issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because that's I, I'm I'm being told to move this along because we got a lot more reaches to get to. But I want to make sure that because these are really good questions and they're important. But is it something that can be addressed in the scoping? We can frame it to go into the scoping as part of the okay. final resolution. Yes. Okay, so good. Make a note of that. And Brittany, good question. Thank you. Yeah, especially the emergency routes, like evacuation routes. Um, you know, that's yeah. really so important. So, I, I think can you address that actually? Um, yeah, I, mean, I could address. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, because yeah, yeah, that's yeah, an important question. factor. Yeah, I mean, so the first question is: Is there any kind of pooling effect? 
There's been extensive hydrodynamic modeling done around all the products around lower Manhattan. And you know, the surge phenomena is of a scale where it doesn't, it doesn't have a pooling or ripple effect on surrounding or adjacent properties. And that's something that's just not a New York City modeling thing. We've looked at it all across the country and all across the world, but we can respond to that specifically as a comment. Two, why we have to cross it? Yeah, we have to cross it because we have to get to the high ground within Tribeca. And the purpose of the project is to get to that high ground. Another way of thinking about this is if we didn't cover 9A, the authority in the lower Manhattan region would be susceptible to the flooding that would occur along 9A down south towards the lower Manhattan area. So 9A, it's not just a closure for Battery Park, it's a closure for lower Manhattan. And the same type of struggles of the closure of this are what the city's walking through because the city's closing off the FDR for ESCR because they're trying to get closured components. And you're right, it's very complicated to close these major roadways. It's a big portion of the project, but it's a great question that we can address in the scoping. And I'm assuming that these are um, temporary barriers that cross the West Side Highway because you can't have permanent barriers. Yeah, I mean, yeah but I'm it's sure in that... case of emergency though, right? That, that, yeah, they're when not... people escape, they're, they're up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you go off. into, yeah, I think right. they get put up at the last minute. I would hope. Yeah, like let's see. Let's, 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 right let's, I would let's, like to see the studies. We do have some scientists in our community, and so the what the the study that you mentioned in terms of the model and the theme on the pooling, if you could share that, um, uh, that would be good. Um, we yeah, do we have done that specifically for this project, but we've done it for the Spide project in the south. But we can certainly, as we do the hydrodynamic modeling. That could be something that we can also have as uh, part of the analysis. This is Gwen. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, Gwen. Uh, we actually did this analysis. Okay. A kind of did this analysis for uh, the benefit of HRPK um, with respect to the North project. So it, it's it's been done. We can share it. Um, we've already done it. Thank you, Gwen. All right, let's move on then. Thank you so much because we really have this is we're well behind. So let's go quick. Okay, so this is that shot. We, we kind of spoke about this already, the alignment going along the um, the west side of 9A. And like I said before, we're gonna work out these details as we get into the design. So I think we've addressed that question. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a plan view, an aerial view of what we had just discussed, but it, it, we're just calling out the heights because a lot of the community um, questioning was, you know, how high is it off grade? How high is it off what I'm standing on right now? We tried to indicate that um, in these locations to give people a sense of uh, the physical intervention that's going to come. Next slide. Okay, actually, there was one more. The, the third question was about um, um, alignment 1B. And I think I'm just going to stay on 1B. We recognize 1B is going to have significant impact on the park and Washington market, which is why 1A is preferred. And I, I think the question is, um, what, what is gonna be done with the impact to the park if 1B were to be constructed? I guess our response is, that's why 1A in part is preferred, and we can look at that as well in the scoping document. I think that makes sense, because you'd be going up Chamber Street, is that why? Correct, that's, we call it the Chamber Street alignment. Yes, that's right. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Timmy, is your hand up? Yes. Still? It is? Okay. No, sorry. Is your hand up, Timmy? If it is, go ahead and oh, it's down. Okay. Quick, Wendy, like one second of yeah, a question. We go, I'm sorry, Justin, like to, we got to we, we go. move we this, right? Because everybody's got to go. We've got yeah, six keep, inches left. Yeah, we move ahead. Move ahead. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. No, no, go ahead. Thank you. Good point, Nick, because we do have to move. Okay, these are the, so these are the less controversial ones. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're in reach two now. Yes. Um, and the first question is, um, maybe go to the next slide. Next slide, sorry. Okay, these questions um, need to understand about the nature based approaches. I think that was a comment that um, was made already. And I think what we had said is that we would, we would take that comment back and, you know, um, that would be maybe part of the overarching scoping comments on baseline, no build, alternative, preferred project, right? And you get that comment to respond in that way. 
the second point is um, the pathway is commonly full with. Uh, Justine, is it appropriate for me to run through each one of these points and read them? Or is that too long? I think it's too long. I mean, basically, yeah. if you've got a comment, it, yeah, I would just what, say, oh, sorry, that's yeah. cut it. That's not just you just said. I would just say these are just comments we received. We wanted to just be able to show them. Yeah. Um, that we get questions specifically on this, but we got comments. Um, so they're not, you know, sort of specifically things to address, but we just want to share them. In terms of the level of feedback that we received. you have answered each one of these questions in a written document, correct? correct? The questions have been answered in the written document and these so, comments also accompany those questions. So, yeah, let's let's move along and um, get asked questions about the reach because. Um, I right. think that if anybody has a question about reach 2. Because there are answers to this and, and if, if we can move along, uh, Tammy, you have 1, go ahead. Um, we'll put it in the environmental impact statement, but I haven't seen anything thus far that when it comes to in case of emergency, I understand that people think that everybody leaves by car, but uh, those of us who lived here on 9 11 can attest that uh, maritime egress is extraordinarily important and how the plan impacts and considers it is a question that we will put into the scoping. The other thing is uh, there are moorings that are here. And so having a socioeconomically diverse public realm is important. And how much does this new plan eat into those possibilities? Which I don't think has been considered as of last month. I'm being stupid now. What do you mean moorings here? I mean places for people to dock? It's a good example. It's there. This is an example of a great comment for the for the um, scoping document. Um, Thank you. It's okay. a great comment, Tammy. Good. Thank you. So make a note, Lucian, <laughs> and let's go on to the next yep. reaches, I guess, right? Next slide, yep. So again, we just, we have a couple of these. You can look at it in the handout where we focused in to try to clarify the heights. Next slide. Same, the plan view. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to reach six now. Go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, reach six. Well, what do you mean by technical complexity? Oh, so first of all, this, the first of this, as Clay was saying, oh, well, just to note, there were comments received on reach six that the team is incorporating and responding to. There weren't questions, so that was the slide that was just briefly shown. These are the specific questions that were asked. So I'll step through these. Unless anybody wants to highlight a specific question and we can focus on that. All right, maybe I'll just step through it. Um, um, what do you mean by technical complexity? How is this a disadvantage? 6A appears from this brief description to be preferable to 6B for minimal impact. Please consult residences nearby for thoughts on disruption to views. <laughs> The response, you know, in this particular instance, technical complexity refers to the need to build a flood defense system within a highly constrained space, given that the relieving platform supports the esplanade almost directly and that abuts the privacy walls for adjacent residential buildings. So any dis any view disruption will be similar across the different options, but the primary difference between the alternatives is whether we can make a least intrusive attempt and put an intervention in without reconstructing the platform, or do we need to reconstruct the platform because we need to do that in order to construct the flood intervention? I, I, so, maybe I, so, Peter, I'm going to interrupt you for because, okay, 6A and 6B, what were the slides we just zipped through? That was not yeah. this or this is? The, the slides for this are following this. So okay. if, if you want, maybe what we can do is I can. Yeah, let's the go to the slides because I don't know what you're slides. talking about. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So this is the existing condition, right? Um, um, this is the preliminary proposed, right? Which is what referred to as, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is six A. And you can see here what we're doing here is we're trying to put a flood protection system. Basically, right at the beginning of the platforms themselves. And you can see the intervention of that is about eight feet, which is more or less the intervention of the privacy wall alongside many of the residences. 
Next slide. Oh, there's just this is just a blow up of that uh, that tries to give people a greater sense of the impact of, of that height on day to day use. Next slide. Next slide. These are plan views that that that, that show the concept. You, you can see, you know, that that red line it's very close to the buildings and that's done on purpose because we're trying to build that red line, not on the platforms, but on terra firma or, or on solid structural systems. So we don't have to reconstruct the platforms. 6B is a full out reconstruction of the platforms. So I think that gets to the question about the technical complexity. Great. So that was really the, the major question on breach six that we had received. There was a request for higher resolution images, which we're trying to provide here. And um, a question about the existing views and you know our response to the existing views is that um, we have to do detailed modeling, of course, to confirm the heights that we're talking about. But the height of the privacy wall is similar to the height of the proposed intervention in most of the cases along this reach. So here, this eight feet, that's what that says there. Yes. It's not indicative of what needs to be built, but it's telling us that's the level of eight. So that was something that would be helpful to me to look at. But next time, show me what along here, if this is one foot or two foot on top of the wall that exists. Because like by gateway, there's a wall. But I also see we have Tammy's hand up, Wendy's hand up, and um, Kalija's hand has been up from before. So in that order. So the questions, yeah. Save me to last. Okay, so Wendy, go ahead, and then Kalija, and then Tammy. I know this is a design question. You're not there yet, but uh, is one of the things that you're going to um, that we'd like to put in the environmental impact statement is, you know, using um, different type of materials, especially you know glass and things like that, so people can preserve their views because we've heard mixed things yes. about that's possible or not. And and the other piece of it is that, you know, how far down do you have to go? You know, do you link it into the building's uh, foundations or, you know, you, you need to kind of anchor it in some way, or if it's just thick enough, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's its own thing. Um, you know, I know those are all design questions. That's not what you have here, but I just wonder if we could somehow put that in the, we want you to explore, you know, glass and other things that will, you know, roller gates uh, so that people can preserve their views as much as possible, obviously. Thank you. Very no, that makes yeah. sense, Wendy. And and I guess what I want to know is, do we have to rip out the walls that are there or we just, and that kind of fit, follows what you said, Wendy, I think. Are you going to yeah. build on top of it or not? And I don't know the answer to the question, but that may be scoping, that may be design, but I think it's scoping because obviously it's less intrusive to, um, um, scoping because I, I have something on there for that. shade and light yeah for shade and light right shade and light and and it's like if also just construction time if, if you're just putting something on top it's a lot easier and less time than it is to rip the whole wall out and do it all over again plus you'll be killing uh, less I'm, trees I, I, I would say technically you know generally the walls that are there right now are not made to withstand the floods that we're designing for they're not founded in a way that would require them that would allow them to hold the moment so we would be generally reconstructing those walls. But this, again, this is something that we're exploring as we get into the design, because we recognize the intrusiveness of the reconstruction of those walls. I mean, that's not lost on us. So yes. we're trying to figure out like how that can be done, how you can make better um, foundation supports for the new walls, what that would look like. Do they fit exactly into the place of the current wall? These are things that we're going to think about during the design. And, and the one more piece of that is that um, on an environmental standpoint, we know we're going to be bringing in materials from long distances, you know, bricks and cement and metal and all the other stuff you're bringing in. You know, I would also say that we should try and buy um, roller yeah. gate that closest, you know, you know, things that we can put on a boat or, you know, I don't know if that's part of the scoping document, but we don't want our environmental in impact to be also, you know, buying every piece of material from halfway around the world to get it here you know closer is the better and i know that's very tricky because governments has to buy from approved vendors 
and proven vendors, but I just put in one more time, we have so many great engineering schools and, you know, geniuses in the Northeast, you know, uh, the less we have to ship this stuff to bring it in, the better. And the more we can use environmentally sensitive um, ways to bring it in and out, the better. Yep. Thanks, Wendy. Um, let's do Kalija, Paul, and then Tammy. You're unmuted, Kalija, and I'm hoping you're, I'm saying your name right. Okay, no, it's, it's actually Kleda. Kleda, yeah. oh gosh, yes. I'm so sorry, right. Kleda. It's all right, it's all right. Um, I actually have a question on how the desired flood elevation is calculated. It was briefly shown in a slide, but then we moved on. And I think someone mentioned that we'll talk about it when we get to reaches, but now we're in reaches and I haven't heard that yet. So can I ask questions about that? I think it's fair. Go ahead. Ask a question about it. Okay. So the way I understand it from the slides that were shown is DFE is calculated. You take the 1%, I'm, I'm sorry, you take the 100 year storm seawater elevation. Then you add to that the predicted sea level rise. Then you add to that wave auction, then run up, then freeboard. Is that correct? Um, generally, wave action and run up are sort of this. Are they're, they're similar? So basic. So it's 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 what you said, but wave action and run up are, are wave action and wave run up are similar. Okay. Actually, that was my follow up question because what I've seen, it seemed like a run up includes wave action. Yes, now, that's correct. Would you please explain how you calculate this run up number? Uh, how yes. does your mic model, like where does it start? How does it change? What affects it? Um, yep. Pete, uh, I'm sorry. And uh, Clayda, hi, Nick Swardone. We actually, if helpful to you, we have a coastal modeling paper on our website, which I'm going to ask Lucian to put into the chat right now. Well, all the science. Please? No, I'm yeah, sorry, Clayda. We we have this is this. Are, they're all great but questions, but they've been question. asked and answered. Okay. And we okay. have six reaches to go through, and these are not these are not scoping questions. These are design questions. Uh, okay, may this be on record that my question yeah. was not answered? Clayda, don't, don't, don't go any place. We don't have a place. paper. I'm sending you, Lucian. We'll put it in the chat. It has everything you want to know about design, storm criteria, still water baseline, sea level rise, water impacts, design flood elevations, compliance with Local 96, coordination with the City of New York. It's he could there. have it's answered my question while you said why he cannot answer my question. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that I don't think I that that's so. Know. Okay, guys, guys, mute everybody for a minute, except me. Clayda, don't go anyplace. At the end of this, we're going to have more questions, and if it's if we have time, because we have to get through the reaches to get through the scoping part. I know why he's rushing because we've taken way too long to get to this point. I want the answer to the question if we can get it, because I mean, for myself. I probably will not understand the written document, so I don't mind the answer, but let's wait. So please be patient, please. I'm sorry to make you wait. Yeah, it's there. It's in, uh, it's in Lucian's inbox and it'll be in the chat momentarily. Thank okay. you. Not to commit Lucian to it, but thanks all. No, thank you. Um, all right, Paul, you get unmuted and Claydia, don't go anyplace because I want the answer. Um, go ahead, Paul. And Wendy, decrease your, or take your hand down if you're not um, asking a question. But maybe you are. So thanks, guys. Can I just confirm that that so so what we're saying here is for the southern end of the es talking about the esplanade between north and south coast, the the esplanade itself is intended now to be outside the barrier. Uh, I think that seems to be the case uh, from from the illustration. Um, I, I hear what we've been talking about the uh, you know trying to integrate this with the with the walls of the uh, you know the, the ground floor residences and so on. What what would happen around the south end of the Esplanade, uh, just just immediately to the north of South Cove, uh, where the 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 the, the, um, uh, the restaurants and the and the uh, preschool? Presumably that would be some other sort of barrier there. And, yeah, and let's move missed... to that reach so you can look at that picture at the same time as you're asking the question. And and have we missed reaches uh, three, four, and five? I, I yes. believe we. Yes. Those, those those have been preserved to last because we wanted to make sure that we reserved enough time to discuss those. Okay. That's why Thanks. Those. Okay. Then 
Um, any other? Did you show him the reach seven? Yeah, which let's is go the one seven. he's asking about. This is reach six. This is yeah. six. Let's yeah, let's just get to it because we're almost done with six. Are there no more scoping considerations that any members of the committee want to bring up for me to record, or are we are we okay with this reach? Um. <sighs> No, there are, okay. there are, we don't, there we don't are have to illusions. produce. Yeah, there, there, there definitely Lucian, are. At this slide, everything needs to be considered for airflow, for transit, yeah. for access to the water, even here, because as we know from 9 11, yeah. even if it was a bizarre kind of a thing, people who stayed still need to be able to evacuate and finding ways that they can evacuate and reach the buildings by both foot and C are important. And in these, there are mature growth trees all along the esplanade. So the question of shade and horticultural and air and ventilation are very important along here. Okay, can we develop that, that ventilation? Is it like, like sea breezes or what do we mean by ventilation? If you open your window, are you getting air? Or do you have a wall that's built, you know, two inches outside your window? If you are in an apartment, whether or the restaurants or whatever it is on ground floor level, or if the intake for the buildings or however it may be, how does the wall impact the built environment in terms of airflow? Thank you. Okay, were there any other questions or did you want to go to reach seven? I think that you've got so you've got the noise, you've got access, you've got open space. For all of these reaches, the drainage or the weight rainwater, but yeah, I think we can go to seven and let's ask answer Paul's or address Paul's question. Okay, so next slide. That this is reach seven. Um there there are there we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll let's park that question and go to Paul's question. Next slide. Comments we receive. Next slide. I'm trying to get to the visuals. Okay, so here's the existing. And if you go to the next slide. It's not going. <laughs> technical difficulties. Yeah, no, technical difficulties. There, there we go. go. Right. Okay. So you can show, and I guess, Paul, can you just repeat your question again, just so I can be clear on it? Yeah, Paul is not hand raised. What happened oh. to Paul? Did I get his name? Right? That was that. No, that no, was I gentleman. thought it was Paul. I thought Paul was because Kalija. Oh, there's Paul. Paul's back because Paul was the question, and then since then, Brittany <laughs> and. I'm still oh, here. I'm, I'm still, still paying there, attention. Paul. Okay, go ahead. Go. Yeah. So, yes. so where I was, where I was wondering about was the those two circles there. It, it's it's the left hand one. So you come to where it says the regatta residences on the very left there, and uh, you know you have a, a wall of residences, but then you have um, when 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 you turn. Uh, east, if you're walking south and then you turn east, so you're on the north side of the South Cove, if you can follow that, there's a there's a a, 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 a bunch of restaurants uh, in that, that colonnade there. Uh, there's mm. a bunch of restaurants, there's a, 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 a daycare center and a few other things. Um, and if you've got an eight foot barrier coming down where the residences are on 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 that north south alignment, um then you know when you when you get to the bottom of the regatta residences um that but the privacy wall then finishes and you've got a colonnade an outdoor seating there and i'm just wondering uh you know how that would be protected i'm you know going back to to your answer from breaches uh, one and two i'm guessing uh you know that's where we would have to employ uh more uh, novel or, or different in intervention methods there yeah that's a great question i'm gonna ask joe marone to um, um respond to that question I mean, it's something you're going to strike, I think, in a number of places. Okay, so yeah, um, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe just broadly. Yes, this is a technically complex alignment piece because we have very proximate adjacent usage. Mm. It's built on a relieving platform, and we have to achieve a certain height in order to get protection. So during the design, 
we're going to be really focusing on what we can do here to balance the performance of the, the thing that we're building versus the impact that it's having, particularly on the regatta. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're, we're, we're very aware of the impacts that this project could have on the regatta, which is why we're trying to integrate that in these types of images to show that we're trying to um, basically make the least impact the regatta in, you know, residences. And then what that means for the platform and to, to the extent that we need to reconstruct the platform in its totality or in portion mm. is something that we're developing during design. It looks to me like the, the when you mentioned the platform, that, that moving the intervention from the waterfront back to the building alignment and leaving the Esplanade platform, uh, you know, open, you know, effectively uh, sacrificing that, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, um, that that's... That seems to be something that that's been taken into account in 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 the first instance, so as not to impact views too much and, and the amenity of the Esplanade. And I think that's a good idea. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions on this reach seven? I don't think so. But before you go forward, um, if anyone's chatting or texting um, in the chat to Lucian. It's distracting because he's trying to take notes for the reaches. So really raise your hand because he doesn't want to ignore anybody, but he's he needs to keep taking the notes here. I think that's what you're telling me, Lucian. Just um, email me. Email me if you have anything to add. But I can't okay. get I can't I can't manage the chat and uh and not lose it later on because also there's text limits. Ah. Uh. Okay, that makes sense too. So yeah, and it'll so so it'll, it'll get Thanks lost if he's not if you don't get to it right away, it'll get lost, and then, yeah. So you're gonna get your your message is gonna get lost. All right. Before I do anybody else from the chat, I'm gonna I mean from the attendee section, I'm gonna go to Jeff. His hand is raised. Yeah, I think Lucian is directing his comment towards me because I was just putting a lot of stuff in the chat. Um, oh. But to, to let both you and Lucian and the other committee members know, I, I've been trying to keep a list of impacts that we want or types of things that we want the, the EIS uh, to uh, address. And rather than raise my hand and, you know, 100 times uh, as, uh, as I think of something that um, uh, Lucian should put in there, uh, I've been just making a list and either I can rattle them off at the end of the meeting um or i can email it to you and lucian however you want me to do it I'm, but um but i i just think it's quicker in, instead of uh, every time we talk of something i add a a point and speak 30 seconds on it that i save it to the end Jeff, i shared a doc a document with you uh where i've been keeping the notes so you can jump on and edit that document so check your email for a, a document invite and, okay. and, and then, yeah, I, I don't know if we need to have it recorded on the on this recording, but uh, certainly a written version of it is useful too, as long as it's shared. But um, all right. So, well, let's thank step you. through a couple more visuals here because they also, yeah. I think, um, you know, re respond to that request to have more detailed images. Next slide. And then I'm going to have to call people in the attendee section. So this is, you can see this, we're trying to get down a little bit and kind of narrow in on what the, 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 the person level experience is like as the intervention is constructed here. So you can get a better sense of what we're, what we're conceiving right now is our alignment. Next slide. Similarly, you can see how we're trying to, you know, uh, 1 of the questions, um. Um, was it about deployables, Justine, in this section? Yes, we're going to definitely in this section investigate the use of deployables to minimize the urban impacts of the of, of the barrier system here. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that in this particular reach. So you can see that. Next slide. And again, you know, the privacy wall along the back. And, you know, we're showing the height there of the, of, of the you know, the resident who's just standing, you know, the height of the intervention. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And this is just a plan view, bringing it all together. So. So what is upper to oh, intertidal habitat? Um, go back a slide. That's kind of what this is here, I guess, right? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to it, but I see like steps going down or something, and then I see by the water. So you're looking to have that flood is what that looks like to me, right? Yeah. Um, well, uh, another way to phrase it is the project team recognizes that certain parts of this project are going to trigger environmental impacts with the state and the federal agencies. And those impacts are going to have impact to the water or to shading of the water. And reach seven may be an opportunity for us to mitigate some of those impacts. As an example, we're proposing to expand the platform and reach two, right? So that will require technically the water will have more shading because of the expansion of that platform that we all think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. We're looking for ways within the projects, you know, the project area to offset some of those environmental impacts as we approach the federal and state regulators with those impacts as a portfolio. And how is that doing it here? Well, in, in this particular case, there's a relieving platform and one of the considerations is to uh, deconstruct that relieving platform and allow wetlands growth um, so that we create more ecology than what's currently there. And that could be considered to be a, a mitigation action from the federal and state agencies. So, you know, we're, like I said, we're in a big process of discussing this with them and what they would require, but this, this one reach provides the, one of the few opportunities for the project to mitigate itself. And so we're thinking about that as we think about the design choices. So why can you do it here, but not um, in the other places when it was asked before? I forget where it was asked. Well, because we don't have, if, 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 we, pull, if we pull back the, um, what's currently there, it's not having a structural impact to anything. Got right? it. So. Whereas, so, so you pull it back and, and then it's just empty space or, or this? The, 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 yeah, some type of wetland construction. And I would again note that, you know, the authority has asked us to, to reach out to Mary Miss and we've been in consultation with Mary Miss, the original landscape designer for this area to make sure that Mary Miss is um, um, being consulted throughout our design process so that we understand this, the intent and the specificity and the vision of her work. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the attendee section for questions. Um, I, I'm going to screw your name again, Klaja, um, I'm going to call on you again. Don't ask the question you asked before, because I'm going to make you wait till the end, but please ask your question. And then Dan, then Paul, or then Michelle, actually, because she hasn't spoken yet, then Paul, then Brittany. So, so I, I I cannot ask for a second. Not yet. When I want to, I want you to do it. Well, we've gotten through all seven reaches, so we skipped. If you notice, just, we did one, Justine, one but yeah. at least he should be able to answer what height they're looking at for this. It doesn't oh, make okay. sense. Okay, that's fine. Answer what height, and then we move on. Because I, yeah. I I I don't want to fight now because we do have to finish. So so I I, I think I think the question was about um, wave action and wave run up. And how that's understood and how that's computed. So this is a great example, right? We have, you know, we have the um, the base flood elevation, which is the surge, right? And surge is a phenomena that like spans kilometers, right? So like the wave, you know, the surge surface generally acts as large, you know, there's not micro elevations, it's one big elevation that spans kilometers. Then we have climate change, which we stack on, and the wave runup or um um the wave action, what we do is we take the physical project itself, like that project might have elevation steps, it might have features on the landscape, it, the, the length of the landscape, there's the grade of the landscape. And in a computer model, we simulate how the energy of a wave, it impacts that landscape, and that wave effectively de-energizes and changes shape, so that the final wall that's necessary to protect from that wave, that the, what, what that wave is when it hits the wall takes into consideration all the work that the wave has to do that is expended as it gets to that point. So in this particular thing, right, the wave would have to run up, let's say potentially through the wetlands, impact vegetative um, features, impact the rising elevation, and then we would get to the design elevation of that wall because we would calculate how that wave loses its steam basically as it hits these different features. 
And we're going to calculate how the waves lose their steam throughout the entire set of conditions along each one of the reaches. And then what we're actually going to do is we're going to build a physical model and we're going to validate that with physical modeling to validate that how we've calculated how the wave loses steam is true in scaled modeling. And that's how we get to the total design elevation, Cleta. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you. May I just ask one small follow up? If I understand you correctly, does that mean that the size of the wave run up depends on how where the flood line is and the geometry as it approaches this flood line, like the slope yes. and what's there, like where there's vegetation or cement or anything like that? Yeah, the details, yes, the, the, the wave run up considers the details of the shape of the thing that it's running up against. The wave, of course, is generated by fetch and by distance, and so that's calculated as well. And then the wave dissipation reflects the features that the wave will run against so that when the wave loses energy and we know where or where our intervention is, we calculate the right height. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, like, for example, like in reach 3, there's a lot of there's a lot of attenuation that takes place because the park is so wide. Mm -hmm. In reach 2, there's not a lot of attenuation because there's not a lot of um, wave interaction between the handrail and Stuyvesant High School. However, mm -hmm. reach 2 has a different hydrodynamic condition because reach 2's waves are coming from the north where the fetch distance is different than, for example, reach 3. So I, I don't want to get, I'm just getting a little granular here, but all of that goes into the wave run-up calculation, which then determines the height of the wave. And then we add freeboard on top of that as a conservative measure. Thank you. That, that's actually all I wanted to ask. Thank you, Cleta. Appreciate it. And thank you, Peter. So is it correct to say that the design, or the, well, the, what, the, what the waterfront looks like and the design of the waterfront will impact um, the heights that are necessary of the walls to be built. It's kind of what you just said, right? Absolutely. And, and, and we're proposing to attenuate the waves as aggressively as possible. Even in some cases, when the platforms get reconstructed. The tip of the platforms and how the platform ends and terminates and the shape of that platform edge has an effect on the wave attenuation. And so what we're doing is we're taking every possible advantage of what we're constructing to attenuate waves. So that the so that the interventions that we're proposing have minimal as as minimized urban impact. Okay, thank you, Dan. And that's going to be like one minute each question because we got to finish. We still have three more reaches to do, and then we have final questions. Go ahead, Dan. I, I wanted to um, thank you, Peter, for answering Clay's question. Just follow up on that that uh, the design elevation is. The key scope and point of all this. So, thank you, Peter, for uh, answering that over Nick's objections. Thanks, Dan. Michelle. Oh, Michelle, you you hung up. Sorry, that was my fault. I I was going to lower a hand and I I whiffed it. Dan, can you re-raise your hand, please? Dan and Michelle, re-raise your hand. Re -hand. Yeah. Lucian, I'll right, put can hands can down if you just unmute. I'll find her. Okay. Um, in the meantime, let's get Brittany go for a minute. Or can you do both at once? I don't want to. Uh, here's Michelle. I see. Okay. Okay. You found Michelle? Okay. Michelle. Michelle, are you able to unmute? I don't know why it's not. Oh, she's back. Okay, I see her. Okay, Michelle should be able to unmute now. There you That's go. Not, I'm sorry. You hear me? Go ahead, Michelle. Yes, we can. Hi, Thank hi, you, everybody. A really quick question, just so that I'm sure. This we're talking about reach six here, right? This is reach seven. No, yeah, this, this is reach is, six, right? Reach this seven. is seven, right? Oh, this is yeah. seven. What we're looking at here, uh, by mirror. Correct me. Yeah, this is reach seven right here. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, um. By the regatta, well, I don't, I, I'm getting a little confused about what we reaches. Go back, where. go back. Six is the regatta. Go ahead. 
go back so by to the this. this whole area, like by the regatta and by the, you know, the walkway, the beautiful forestry walkway that we had that you were just at, which is the Reach 7. Those are both filled with, um, you know, parkland. What, what's going to happen to all of those? I mean, it's, 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 it, it's an entire little ecosystem there, right? Um, along the South Cove. So in order to build that wall, which is further back, and to build the wall by the regatta, I mean, by where Miramar is, are all of those, uh, what's going to happen there? Is that, does all that landscaping, all that vegetation have to be uh, removed, destroyed um, in order to build that wall? Or can any of it be retained? Or how, how are you dealing with that? That's a great question. And we are certainly looking to maximize, um, or sorry, minimize the impact to the Merrimus landscape. Like I said before, we're in, we're in consultation with her. Um, we, the preliminary alignments that we've laid out um, have as a high priority the minimization of any impact to the existing landscape. And I think you know you'll see as we come to the community means with more specifics on this, you'll see the choices that we're trying to make to avoid the impacts to the mature trees and to the spirit of of her landscape design which we recognize is a beloved part of the community. Now, would that be the same, the same, um, are you considering the same thing for like where I live on Liberty? So if we, we, when we, you know, I was looking at the Liberty residence again, you know, the, the, the wall is gonna be built closer to the buildings, but in order to build that wall, I mean, we have beaut like right by uh, 380 Rector Place and, um, you know, right along the water there, there are beautiful, beautiful gardens. They're very extensive and lush vegetation um, what's that's this, and that's so like my, I have, I'm I'm greatly concerned about like what we're what's going to happen there, in in addition to other things I'm concerned about. But that's that's a different question altogether. So, um, so Michelle, if we're going to frame this into the scoping, you're concerned about the vegetation, the gardens. I assume based on knowing you, that includes the migratory birds. The oh, impact of course. On well, the migratory I, I, birds. Yeah, that's a whole other that's a whole other thing though. But because there are. There are so many migratory birds that use that area, so many. Um, Correct, but it is something that needs to go into the scoping for conditions for things that they need to take a look at, so. Yes, okay. Good questions, Michelle. Thank you. And Tammy, thank you for um, narrowing it. Okay, Brittany and then Megan. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks so much. Um, I do want to say, um, uh, Justine, this is very helpful. So thank you for running this this type of meeting um, and, and having them answer the questions. Just want to call you out publicly uh, for that. Um, I do like the idea of the wetlands. And I think to Megan's point earlier, biodiversity, I think we should not maximize that, you know, with, with nature-based solutions. Biden, and I think I said this in the scoping uh, or the official testimony a few weeks ago that Biden at COP27 talked about how they're prioritizing nature-based solutions. And, you know, as you're get, looking at FEMA and even there's funding, federal funding sources that are going to be opened up as you add in nature-based solutions, increase um, biodiversity, different wetlands, ecosystems, et cetera. So I'm pleased to see this happening here. I hope it could happen more in other places. Specifically, we should, when we get to reach two. Um, one of, I just want to clarify, just make sure I understand it totally um, accurately, um, is that, so the way that I, going back to Clayda's um, question, the way that I think about this is this design elevation is greatly influenced how, where the flood line ha um, has to go up to is greatly influenced by where it's placed, by the landscape, by the ecosystem in front of it, by all these design elements. Um, it, it, and so it's not a static um, thing. So if you change a piece of the design, that could influence kind of the the height of the elevation if you change the flood line that could change the height of the elevation if you add more wetlands if you add more green spaces if you add more green infrastructure that could change how the 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 height the um dfe is that that's is that am i understanding that correctly yeah i mean you use the adjective greatly i would say it, it has a definite effect um, and it, it, it's the one part of the design for elevation that is variable. You know, we've, we've chosen 30 inches of climate change. That's, you know, we're not varying that across the reaches. We've right. chosen 
you know, so this is the one piece that is variable. And it's, and like I said before to Cleta, it's, you know, when we talk about wave dynamics, it's not just the wave run up, but it's the wave generation itself. And, you know, the, the opportunity that the open water has to create the wave that then crashes onto the landscape. So that's all very dynamic, very calculatable, and mm -hmm. very variable per reach. And that's one of the things that we're going to be doing during design, looking at that very closely. And how, and then, and then you can adjust the landscape and the design inland, and you know, kind of build wetlands to, you know, kind of absorb or minimize the shock of that wave and how far yeah, it can reach. Yeah, I, I mean, think wetlands we... is one is one. I, I would say if we go to reach three, we can pick up this conversation. Yeah. Okay. We could keep moving because I think we've covered this point several times now. I just want to make sure I'm clear, Gwen. So thank you. Up here on mute. No, I, I think I'm here. I just said. Uh, I think Justine was. Yeah. yeah she was. Oh, okay. Ah, so sorry. I am talking and I'm not listening to. I was on mute. Um, what I understood you to say is that there's some space here and the design of elevation can it incorporate um uh, marshes whatever this is going to be called here oh i gotta look at it to see because i have to write my words down um uh the wetlands and have a nature-based solution it's it's possible here in the picture we're looking at now by south cove it's also yeah. but it's not possible particularly um along uh South Battery Park City um, by the Esplanade because there's just not enough space from the relieving wall and and moving it on. And yeah, then, be, yeah, can I, I mean, just be really clear with you on that, Justine? Though just just so that I don't have any. Yeah, and that's South Battery Park City. We haven't talked about North yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The reason we're doing this here, that's it from a design perspective. At this point during the design, it's not being driven by the wave dynamics. It's being driven because we're anticipating that we have to mitigate for the project. And so part of the reason why we're proposing wetlands here is as a mitigation step from the formalized DEC and federal review of the permits that we're going to apply for. So that was what drove that decision. Um, you know, does the wetlands have a better wave attenuation profile than what's currently existing? We didn't analyze that, but we're driving to this because of the mitigation effects. That'd be super okay. clear. Thank you. And then, um, uh, Megan, you want to talk or no? And Brittany, I think you got the, yeah, Megan, you want to speak. So go ahead, me, me, Brittany. And then, I'm sorry, go ahead, Megan. And then Brittany, we'll talk more about what you were talking about when we get to the other reach, which is we're going sure. through next. Sure. Yeah, I had originally put my hand down because Brittany did um, speak uh, a lot to what I was going to ask about, but um, I, I did, I, I kind of wanted to get a little bit more um, clarity on what are we mitigating again? Because it seems like you, the only reason that we're thinking about putting wetlands here is because you're going to be damaging the ecosystem elsewhere. Um, and, and this is a mitigation for that. I, I was as confused about that. It's a good, it's a, it's a good question. So I'll, I'll be very brief on this. The project is currently conceives has components that either create more shade or more displacement. So we're creating more shade in reach two when we're extending the platform over the water. That's an impact to shading. In some cases, when we're reconstructing the platforms, the, the design of the pile foundations might need to be of a greater diameter to meet current codes. And that displaces, even if it's an inch of water, maybe a, a 10 inch pile goes to a 12 inch pile. That's a displacement of water. Those are small little effects across all the different reaches that add up to an impact that's going to be explored during the EIS process. And the DEC and the feds are going to look to have that mitigated. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my other uh, question is, I, so it's great that you're mitigating. Um, do, are you only extending these wetlands to the extent that you would need to just to mitigate those other impacts, or can we go further to get greater, um, you know, habitat? Uh, is is there any reason? I, I don't want to just do the minimum, you know. No, no, it would understood, be... understood. Yeah, I would say the answer to that is, you know, 
as a design team, you know, we're probably not that detailed into this yet to answer that properly. I would say, you know, what we've what we've established here is that there's a concept of pulling back the platform and having some type of wetlands there, but we haven't delineated that or done enough detailed design to really answer that. But that type of question, that type of conversation is what we look forward to having when we have the engagement session on this particular reach. Okay, great. And, and, and at that time, we'll provide you with more detail that you know speaks to those design choices. Great. And then one last comment. Um, I know Brittany mentioned federal funding. Also, you know, nature-based solutions are eligible for state funding on uh, under you know the Clean Water, Clean Air, and Green Jobs Bond Act. So it's something um, to consider. Thank you so much. I'm making notes of that because I want to talk about funding in a bit, but not right yet. All right. Okay, so we want to move to reach three. Thank you. Yeah, let's go to reach three. Actually, uh, Justine, I've had it, my hand up. This Wendy. Oh, I didn't see. Sorry, Wendy. No, yeah, no, no problem. I was just wondering is is part of the study, um, and it's not the same type of thing. But when they built Pier Twenty Six, as you know, they there was a real. Um, thoughtfulness about putting those rocks at the end of the pier and putting grasslands and you know they tried to create a wetlands for nature and because of the birds and things like that but unfortunately because of the speed of the river and you know already um that's not really working very well um i was wondering if you as part of the eis is is it that you study you know how the hudson is affecting similar parks that have gone into the water because that is a big deal i know I know that, um, you know, at one point uh, before your current project, there was a design to go into the water north of Stuyvesant, but it was de determined that the feds would never give approval to actually, um, you know, touch the water and, and do a greater impact. Um, and, and Pier 26 became, you know, the same type of thing. They were trying to do something to be helpful. Is that part of the is the scoping is to see what's actually working in a practical sense right now? The answer to that is yes. I think I think you know you, you recognize you know you can't you know the laws of this country don't allow you to displace or, or shade water because of recreation, right? That's just the way the way the laws are written, right? So there's certain Correct. constraints that we see, particularly in Hudson River Park area. Um, but I think that's the type of question that you can you can provide in the scoping document. And that will be explored more more technically during the design process. Yeah, I, I I would like to just ask for the resolution to include you know referencing Pier Twenty Six because that's on a mini scale uh, shows the difficulty in the in the rapidly flowing Hudson why wetlands and grasses are really struggling even though it's a great concept in theory. Thanks, Wendy. That makes sense. Okay, hey, let's go to reach three. Next slide. Yes, please. Oh, these are just more expanded views. We'll keep going. Yeah, that. I think we went through, we went backwards. There's reach three. So here's reach three. So there was, there's some comments and questions. Do you want to just go to the let's visuals just, and ask the questions Let's there? go to the, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. Let's just go okay. move along. So here's the existing conditions. And here's the preliminary proposed alignment that's shown. You can see that we're calling out the height of the interventions. In some cases, like on the north part near Chamber Street, the height of the intervention is actually no height because the height of the current surface of the road is equivalent to where we want to be in terms of the flood protection system. In certain cases, as you go down south, you can see the walls are three or four feet. And lower down, as we get closer to reach four, the interventions approach seven feet. So that gives you a sense of the scale as a person who walks by. But let's go to the next couple of slides and they can show that in more detail. So here's the playground area, existing in the proposed playground area. Next slide, maybe what I'll do, Justin, I'll go through the slides and then we'll have the questions. Does that work? Does that work? I think that makes sense. Thank you. And then here's here's again the plan view that shows um, what we just talked about, and we had that focus area in the playground. So maybe we'll just pause here for questions. Right, Wendy, is your hand still raised, or is that old? I see Jeff too. 
It is old, but of course, I'm always happy to uh, to jump in here. Um, you know, in our scoping document, you know, are we going to talk about uh, impacts in terms of, um, you know, just the, the, you know, I just think about all of this stuff is going to create a lot of uh, dust and kick things up and all this kind of thing for uh, our playgrounds going to be closed at this point. Can they stay open during it? Is that, I mean, I, I'm sure that was it's one of the questions. Yeah. But I, I, uh, anyway, I mean, people want it open as there's, much as possible. Yeah. There's no answer, but it is a question and a concern we can put in the scoping. You Thank know, we're you. not going to get that answer today. Fair. We just need to Sense. put it in the yeah. scoping document. We put it in. Exactly. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Question I have, I mean, I see on this uh, slide that there are wave attenuating uh, park features uh, indicated. Um, and, and of course, the, the alignment uh, implies that all uh, or at least a significant portion of the park would be um, flooded in a storm event in a design uh, uh, storm event. Um, and my, my question is to what extent and presumably that would be different between alignment A and alignment B, where B is closer to the waterfront. To, to, to what extent is the park being redesigned to be more resilient to flooding, both in terms of whatever vegetation may be there? It, it, I mean, are all those trees gonna die if it floods? Um, right. what, what, what happens in a, in a storm event when, uh, when these measures actually make a difference, which implies that the, the, the park would be flooded. Right. It's a good question. So I think during the design process, we're going to evaluate the existing um, ecology, the tree species, the, um, the, the, uh, the adaptability they are, they, they, they are to um, a marine environment. And I think, you know, part of our conversation about replanting is going to be driven by what would be the best and most adaptable species for that area. Part of the design is going to look at enhanced drainage. You know, there's certain sort of, we call them swales or low points currently that are there where there's poor drainage. And what we're looking to do is we're looking to eliminate those poor drainage conditions with, I'm going to say, smaller interventions within the park area, maybe shallow, uh, you know, shallow drainage pipes, um, you know, uh, different types of recontouring, maybe, or regrading of certain pieces of the property. The extent of that impact, we haven't figured out yet because we haven't done the design, but we certainly want to make the park as resilient as possible with additional drainage, possible regrading, and a refreshed look at the species that are there so that the species and the end product of the topography is as resilient as possible. And, and uh, as you're considering these design uh, issues. Um, I mean, is is one option to leave the park essentially as is in terms of vegetation, but then be prepared in the event of a storm for some substantial reconfiguration of the park uh, in terms of its vegetation, or or would the approach be, let's plan for the storm now and change the park now? I'm not sure which is the right answer, but it does seem to me to be something worth studying since after all these storms aren't could be another 25 years before a storm like this occurs that's a great question actually that's like the perfect subject to have when we have the community meeting on reach three because you know we're not proposing right now to take up all the trees and replant them with species that are more adaptable to marine environments the, that, that there's a balance there between letting live what is and even if the trees that are there are not the, the you know the, the perfectly designed species for that environment they're there and they're growing and maybe they're not as healthy as they could be, but they're surviving. And then there's the balance of when we do impact um, the topography and the, the grading, are there opportunities to replace trees with better species that are more adaptable? So those types of conversations, I think, once we get into the details of the extent of those impacts, I think we're going to have some pretty robust conversations with you folks about what the best choices are. Thank, thank you. I think those conversations are important. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Tammy, I'll go to you in a minute. I just have a quick question. So the wave attenuating park features, are they there now or that's no. what you're planning? Okay. So we're planning that's planning so, if you're so, if you're gonna do something. Right. We have this from a from a from a technical perspective, we have this great runway of a wave. 
right? The wave has to basically crash over the park lawn to get to our barrier. And we're just, you know, we can't, can't hold ourselves back from putting some attenuation features there because it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's an, it's some technically it's sort of an obvious intervention, right? You know, mm -hmm. we have this great runway. We want to interrupt the energy. The attenuation features don't have to be constructed as robustly as the walls themselves. They can be integrated a little bit more easily with landscape elements. And so, you know, we're looking forward to putting those attenuation features in so that the height of the intervention on the wall is basically minimized on River Terrace. Got it. Okay. Then that's the idea of what you said about what you do, what the edges matter, uh, effects, the design effects. All yep. right. Thank you, Tammy. And then we got a bunch of people in the waiting room here. Five. Go ahead, Tammy. So I guess one of my questions is how often is the park and the esplanade going to be flooded in the scenario that you're proposing? And how will that be reflective in terms of public realm usage, availability to the park? Um, it is a very different approach than has been taken in other parts. And while that's all well and good, there's been no notation, even with the way of attenuating park features, which are, you know, unknown. Is that a bench? Is that a row of planters? You know, what kind of opportunities are you looking at? And does that, you know, what does it look like in 2050 in this park? Right. That's a great, actually, yeah. When ask me the same question. <laughs> so I think and I, the, what we owe the authority is a memorandum that says, this is how the park is going to perform over time. And on certain types of high tides, certain types of elevated high tides because of climate change, um, there will be a certain amount of inundation of that park. And what we're going to do is look at the levels of inundation, explore that for a couple of different scenarios, and then ask the question, is there something we can do now to sort of make that minimized? Like, for example, right now, we're not currently contemplating any kind of regrading right near the platform. But after we do that scenarioizing, maybe for it's very cost effective right now for us to do some regrading at sort of the toe of the park so that the, um, the effects of sea level rise don't so easily come into the park. And so we're really looking at the cost benefit ratio of, of some of those interventions, and that'll be a conversation that we're going to have with the authority. And I'm sure that'll be part of the public co commentary on this reach as well. So uh, follow up to that with the scoping, we would put our comments in there along those lines. And then the other question obviously is why wouldn't you put wave attenuating park features closer to the water to protect the park? And the public realm versus focusing solely on the real estate as you come closer inland. We're looking to protect the park and have potential usage. So, without building walls, what kind of attenuation water redirection can be looked at and considered along the edges to enable the park to remain open for longer periods of time? Yeah, no, that's a that, that's a great point. Uh, uh, without getting into the weeds, you know. Wave attenuation implies it submergence. And so if you put a wave attenuation feature on the edge, the attenuation feature will be submerged and water will still go by it, but with less energy. So it's going to have a different type of impact on the park. But Tammy, it's a great point. You know, we haven't like, you know, it's not cast in stone where the attenuation features are or the type of attenuation features, what they look like, how they're experienced by the public. That's something that we're going to develop in during the design process and then have a conversation with you folks about, you know, your perspectives on what they look like, what they could be, how they could be placed. There's certain technical requirements that they need to be made to work, but there's a lot of flexibility in that to make it um, more, um, um, what's the word? Um, um, to achieve other goals other than hydrodynamic goals. It, it's a better, it's a better usage for the public realm. Yeah. I'd like to, the one thing I, I have not seen that seems to be missing is any kind of um, water redirection possibilities through landscape, through even soft surface and hardscape. And I would hope to put that in uh -huh. a scoping meeting to have that as a request. So potentially there is a look at, for example, um, when you consider the new park that was done in the battery, the children's playground, uh -huh. it was taken into effect for water surge and tide and re water redirection. 
And that yeah. doesn't seem, I have not seen that in any reach in any place other than actually the last reach, which is looking at, you know, the very top and the very bottom, you're looking at marshland and, and yeah. other things, you know, for water absorption and retention and things. But I haven't really seen anything that talks about like a redirection um, and wave attenuation other than in here. So thank you. That's, it. That's a good point. Thanks, Tammy. That was really cool. Yeah, I didn't even know that word wave redirection, but it makes sense. Very cool. All right. So in the, I don't see anybody else on, with their hand raised on the top. So we're going to go to the attendees. Dan, Emily, Paul, Klaja, and um, Brittany. In that order, please. Okay. Hi, guys. Is there a, uh, a sort of engineering related reason to reconstruct and move the basketball court and the handball court? And then the second question is, is there a reason to put the wall in front of the playground instead of along river terrace, given that I think what we discussed today was further from the water is better from an elevation standpoint, and you can perhaps leave the playground intact. I think for the sake of time, I think maybe my response would be, but those are design decisions that we're, that we're evaluating right now. And there's some optionality in that design, um, and how to how to handle, you know, the courts and how to handle the playground and what to elevate. I think that's something that's being discussed right now with the design team. Sorry. So the answer to that is is no. There's no engineering reason to. There's no technical. There's no technical reason, and it's a great opportunity to make a comment. Okay. Peter, for we'll the go ahead. second part about the playground and the wall in front of it versus yeah. back. It, it's a point to put in the scoping document for That's consideration what is ask. what he's saying. Yes. Yeah, because it seems like you're saying it's the design um, element, but it, it, it depends where the wall goes. So we should ex we should examine both for the engineering part. Very good question, Paul. Uh, uh, Dan. So, yes, I'm Lucia, make a note. Are you good? You had a second question, Dan? Oh, it was just about the wall in front of the playground versus in back. Okay. And perhaps you can maintain the recently rebuilt playground while also having yes. instead of putting the barrier further from the water, which I think as we discussed is better from an elevation standpoint. Perfect. Thank you. Emily. Emily, you're unmuted. Question about the height of the wall. I know it says that you said that it's variable depending on the elevation of the park, uh, but there is that wall just along River Terrace, the stone wall. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if, per, if let's say that that wall around Rockefeller Park were between the park and the stone wall um, instead of in front of the park, do you think that, that the height of that wall would exceed the, the existing height of the stone wall? um right or, that's a great question yeah so i would say that the the i think in general um and you can see here in this couple call outs um where the height of the posed wall is very similar to the height of the stone wall i don't want to i don't want to be misquoted here and, and and say something to the exact foot but i would say you know our intent to take this alignment is to mimic the stone wall because the stone wall is already an element that people are used to seeing, right? So it's sort of like, oh, right here. It's like, it's like, okay, well, they just make this a wall that's flood resistant as opposed to a wall that's decorative, and you don't have a bigger of an impact. So that was our intent. But you know, I, I, again, I repeat, you know, I, 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 I hope you know, at least as I just describe the modeling work that has to be done. It's also true that. Um, the design has to progress a little bit more before the final modeling can be done because that component of how the wave interacts with the structure itself is something that we can't do until we design the thing. And so, you know, what we're doing is we're doing sort of an iterative approach here where we're, where we're making some technical guesstimates as to what we think the wall is heights are going to be required based upon our experience with wave runoff analysis. And then when the design begins to fill itself in in more detail, then we're going to subject that design to that analysis that I talked about before. And like I said, 
We're even going to build a scale model of this. That'll be, you know, these things are done in engineering because at the end of the day, calculations don't solve every problem when it comes to turbulent flow. And so it's always good to get, you know, scaled models that represent this. I'm not sure that's going to be done on site. That's probably going to be done at some sort of university or lab, but we'll certainly be providing opportunities for the public to, to at least see pictures and video of that scaled model as we're testing our interventions on the scaled out environment. Thank you. That's particularly Thank you. cool, by the way. Right. Thank you. All right, Paul. Mute, uh, Lucian, can you unmute Paul? There, there we go. go. There we I'm go. Sorry. Yeah, okay. There you go. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, uh, Peter. You, Peter, you've been at this for uh, you know three and three hours, coming up to three hours now. So thank you very much uh, for for um, indulging us. Um, just first up, I had on my notes here. Uh, you know, my first question at this point was why not keep the barrier on the east side of the playground uh, along the existing wall? So I agree with the previous uh, questioners there uh, about potentially using uh, the wall that runs along River Terrace if it can be used. I think it's already it's already probably I don't know eight feet, nine feet above water above uh, mean high water. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even add a couple of feet to it, and it's not going to reduce the amenity of that wall very much, but might uh, might might give you um, you know good bang for your buck. I I, I I would I would ask about my my second question though um, is uh, I, I use the ferry uh, to and from Brookfield fairly regularly, and as we as the ferry arrives along that north line, um, you know one notices that the the the, the wall the wall there or the balustrade there above the height of the footpath is solid in some lengths of it and poor and 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 porous in other lengths it's just mm -hmm. it's not stone it's it's metal railings um has any thought been given to solidifying that balustrade all along the seawall and maybe even adding 12 15 18 24 inches to that um and i guess in in that respect if you were to raise if you were to solidify that wall and raise it say uh, 18 inches or two feet Statistically, would that make a difference uh, in terms of, of potential events, uh, overtop events? Yeah, that's a great comment to make in the scoping document. I mean, the the the, the um, right now you, you're basically talking about sort of curbing the edge so that the water doesn't so easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of like a, the bow of a ship kind of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's but also good. making it solid because in some parts, as I say, some parts it's a wall, and some mm -hmm. parts it's a it's a metal, you know, like a balustrade, you know, that yep. you can see through it. Um, yep. And uh, you know, to the extent that I'm always cautious when I'm running down there that I don't drop my, uh, you know, my phone because it'll slide into the water. Uh, whereas yep. if it was solidified all along, then clearly that's a barrier. <laughs> right. That's a good comment. We'll take it back for the design team. Yeah. You know, I mean, you just take a walk along that balustrade and yeah. that, that wall, and you'll know what I mean. You'll see what I mean. Yep. Good, good point. Good, in that's interesting to look at. And Clay something Jeff. we can put in the scoping document. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you. exactly. So that's a good point. Clayja, thank you, Paul. Clayja, then Brittany. Somebody needs to unmute Pleja. Hello. There you go. Can you hear me? Now we can oh, hear okay. you. Now the buttons appeared. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thank you, Peter. You've been so helpful with all your answers. I, I, I've learned so much. Um, just like all the other speakers, I had the same question, which should tell you that from looking at it, it seems very obvious that uh, this flood line should go along River Terrace uh -huh. instead of around the playground that was just renovated. So the kids missed out during the entire pandemic on using the playground. Now, I have children myself, so we are heavy users. And to think that it will be taken away from them again, it just said and wasteful. And same with the duck pond. As I, real, uh, as I understand uh, these reaches correctly, this is also, this uh, flood line goes in front of the duck pond. So my answer again is, why is this like when it seems that all of us have the same question? Why did it start with the flood line in front of the playground and the duck pond? And follow up to that, 
in the scoping document, I would really, really like to see what the height of the alignment would be if the flood line was along the river terrace. So if you can do that modeling for the flood line being along the river terrace, that would be great. So then we could really compare these two alternatives. That makes Kesha, sense. Kesha, I just want to, I want to, I want to be clear. You're asking for the flood protection line to be on river terrace, which would then allow the playground to flood. Uh, yes, but the playground did flood during Sandy. I was here. I could see it from my window and after Sandy, we all went off and used it. And, and I also want to say that everything here is for the 100 year flood, which by definition is once every 100 years. We're not talking the flood, the park flooding every year and we already rebuilt it. So if it, if we were to put this thing in front of the park, we would destroy the park. But. 100% probability, right? So if it gets flooded, it gets damaged, huh, maybe that's less than 100% probability. Let's take a if and as we're doing this reach, it does make sense to also go one more down because yeah. the duck pond is not shown in this reach, actually. Yeah, so let's look at both because I think people have focused, as you point out, they're focusing on Rockefeller Park and the duck pond. So let's see if we can get it. So, Lucian, change the slide. Yep, next slide then, yeah. Um, slide. Yeah, reach five. There you go, because that's the bottom end of Rockefeller Park. Uh, the yeah, duck the duck pond. pond. Right in front of Irish Hunger. Yeah. And Lily Pond, you're calling it. Yeah, the duck pond. So, okay, this is existing. Let's go to the next slide, Lucian. I sent a note to unmute Brittany as well. Yeah, because let's do let's do the questions on both these two together. Yeah. Oh, it's switching. Okay, reaches. But yeah, not not the written questions. Let's skip. So, Brittany, you should be unmuted, and you can speak if you want to as well. Yeah, Dick I would says. say I've seen the duck pond. I, I echo on the um, the playground. Let the playground flood. They just spent I don't know sixteen million dollars. I think I don't remember the exact number redoing it like just a couple of years ago. Um, it just opened. Pond, yeah. it, the the duck pond is 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 such a critical component of of like our our neighborhood up here in the north. The kids use it. My kids, you know, in the spring, the kids go and see the ducks being hatched daily. They'll yeah. want to go by. It's just it's such a, a critical component of, of of the neighborhood character. It's also used heavily by the school. So. Um, there's a wall up at the top, and if you, you know, I think that if you adjust the flood line, um, you know, and, and, and keep the duck pond, I think that's really, really critical. Um, the other piece I wanted to go back on is on reach three. Um, I would really like to see once you do that cost benefit analysis, I hope all those are going to be published out so the public can see them of allowing um, park to flood. I echo. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you get a, a damaged tree and a once in a hundred year storm, then you replace it then, not go in with a hundred percent certainty and destroy all of it. Um, one of my questions to, and I don't know if this goes in the scoping document, is could we consider moving the Hurricane Maria uh, memorial? Maybe now that we're redoing this all and putting it in a more appropriate place rather than you know right in front um, in a you know critical. Uh, area where where kids play and and and, and blocks views, um, so I think that that should be considered as part of this. Um, and um, um, the 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 wave uh, breakage piece that's it's interesting. I think what's really important. I hope that you know, just giving you guys some perspective of the neighborhood. You know, the way that, that this park is used is is there's so many young kids here um, on any given day it's just packed um, and people from all over manhattan come to use this this green space it's used by little leagues and soccer leagues and 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 and, and in fact there's one event of the year that i think is one of the best ones which is the the local public school elementary school puts on their talent show in the park and sets up a stage and i just think it's important context for for you guys to just know how it's used and heavily loved and and you know just maximizing all the green space and the kids are climbing the trees and and there's baby class music classes underneath the shade of of the mature trees and it's just 
you know, that's where a lot of like the sensitivity comes that people just love this park. And it's so, you know, we don't have backyards, we don't have houses, you know, we use this park yeah. as, as our backyard, as the community yeah. backyard. So, so Brittany, for really, the really scoping important. document, because that's what we're here that's for. That's what we'll do, yeah. Um, you're talking about tree retention or addition, space. open space. Yep ensuring that there's access to that throughout the entire process and beyond yes enhancing the availability for open green space as yeah. you work on other issues yes yeah yeah that's perfect that's it. yeah that, i mean yes and, and that kind and of flows through yeah. maybe that's not every reach away yeah and put more green space there so i think the question that we need peter to answer is when you're looking at what he preliminary proposes for the lily pond. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm missing it, but is it gone? It's yeah. gone. Yeah. So, so I, I, again, this is, this is again, an example of. We wanted to provide. Visualizations so that the, so that. Residents can understand what we're doing, but we haven't done any design on this and there's still a bunch of optionality that we're working as a design team with the authority on. And the existence of this duck pond is, I think, something that we're discussing right now. So I, I think maybe the best way for us to respond to this is because I know this is this piece has moved around a bit. Let mm -hmm. me we'll 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 work with the authority to respond more specifically to what is the future of the duck pond region, and we'll provide more specific input as to what the concept plan is, and then we'll have commentary on that as we go into the community meetings more specifically. One of the things that concerns me, Peter, is it looks like we kind of wiped it out there. So yeah. not only does it look like you wiped it out, but what you're not showing representationally is the fact that you're also proposing to put exactly where the duck pond is, the ferry terminal. Yeah, exactly. And it's not shown in any of this, so I'm not really quite sure yep. how you can say this is representational um, unless you're zooming out and telling me that it's on a slide somewhere that I just don't see. No, no, it's a, it's a, again, it's a great point, Tammy. Well, like I said, like I said, we'll, let us respond to the duck pond thing specifically. And I know we're going to talk about the ferry terminal. So let's, 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 let's get through reach four and then talk about the ferry terminal so that we, we talk about them. So, so we give that its due, but, but certainly we'll get back to you on this duck pond. And I did want to make a, you know, the, just a sort of a, a technical commercial break here. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be just. A one in a hundred year storm doesn't occur once in a hundred years. So at the next community meeting we're together, I'm going to bring my hundred sided dice. And typically what we do is we, at community meetings, everybody who walks in rolls that dice, you know, and some meetings you have a hundred rolls and you hit the number five times. Some meetings you have 200 rolls and you don't hit the number. So, you know, really what we're talking about is there's a chance a one in a hundred chance every year that that occurs. And I think the hundred sided dice, we can provide that to you folks and you can give it to you can use that. I think it's a great visualization of the statistics of what happens during these extreme weather events. So, sorry, commercial break. No, yeah, thank you. That was interesting. Um, all right. So, Dan and then Barbara Ireland, um, and Paul's hand is up again, but I want to get to the next point, but I have to make a comment. I love that duck pond. It is such a beautiful feature. Uh, Brittany mentioned things about it. It also was a place where uh, people of all ages go to, to, uh, relax, see, uh, commune with nature. It's a beautiful little enclave there. Can you forward um, to the next slide? Because I, I think I missed the fact that it's actually on the next slide. Oh, let's see, because try it. I don't see it there unless you move to someplace else, but that's the ferry, which is fine. Oh. We need to talk about that. Oh, so, oh sorry. So, okay, then. I, yeah, no, mistake. so, so it mistake. looks like it, you, you need to do more work for the. Oh, Justine, no, for, 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 Justine, have one slide. Yeah, one back, one back, one, one slide because you can see it's not there. Lucian, go no, back. If one. There's a slide that says new water feature. All right. I don't see it. Maybe it's one forward. There yeah, it is. it's a new water feature. Yeah, it's but it's but but Tim, you're it's it's we're we're a it's bit not. in the yeah. it's it's not the same. It's, as... it's not it's not what it's not what we're asking for. Yeah, yeah. Understood. Understood. And and also it is of merit to note that the uh it does look like part of the playground that's on the south side is short is, is missing. Yeah. Is that true? Um, you know what? I'm gonna ask Lee Alton to respond to that. Lee, can you respond to the playground question? 
Yeah, I think that if we, thank you, Peter, um, if we go back to the previous. Uh, view, Actually, I or... want you to stay here. And the reason why is because from the very bottom, you can very clearly see it's a very good rep you know, visual representation for where the Irish hunger memorial is, where the building is. Mm -hmm. And where we know, for example, currently where the duck pond is that's missing here. And the edge, the southern edge of the playground where the hmm. next to the duck pond, there is a yeah. uh, there's a seating area and then just north of the seating area. There's a uh, you don't want to call it a carousel. It's a you push it around. It runs around. I don't know what, I don't know what the a play feature. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, so I. First, I want to echo what Peter is saying. I think this is extremely helpful for us to hear directly from you and understand specifically the characteristics and the value of the the duck pond or the lily pond. We've been calling it the duck pond internally as well. Um, mm. and, and it's really valuable for our design process as we are studying this area. Um, specifically to your question about the playground, we, uh, in the plan that we're looking at now, we did not change the extent of the footprint of the, the playground. We're not removing any features here. Um, but what we are considering and trying to address with this alignment um, is uh, universal accessibility in this area. And we don't want to do anything that would um, touch or impact the Irish Hunger Memorial. And so we're trying to balance a few factors uh, as well as keeping kind of a, a fully passive alignment. But again, I think what Peter was saying is, is um, kind of where we are right now in terms of our, our very early in our design process. And so hearing your questions and hearing your feedback is really helpful as we develop um, options to be mm -hmm. shared as part of the um, kind of open uh, public engagement process. Yeah, so I think that that's fair. Um... And I think that we need to, well, we'll talk about it, but in the scoping document, we need to talk about where this, this, uh, the wall goes, whether it's in front of the park and the duck pond or behind it, and we can talk about different things, but I guess that's going to, that we can put in the scoping document. It, it um, is. I mean, scoping document, we will certainly put about transportation and access. Yeah. But what I don't appreciate and can't tell, and it's really important is where representationally moving the ferry terminal north. Now that was presented in the alignment conversations and everything in September. And yet on these slides in the scoping, is that just that faint dotted line that's barely able to be seen? Right, so the way, so, so the, what this is representing right now is that the ferry terminal moves temporarily during construction and then returns back to its original location after construction. So the original location is the dotted line is what Tammy said. No, 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 no. No, the, the original location is where they have it currently. Yeah, the gray, the gray. Yeah. And, and what I find hiding the ball, no offense intended, Peter, but that's really, you know, the one thing that Battery Park City Authority knows is that pier is and is a known environmental hazard because Port Authority of New York, New Jersey has already identified that it has negative impacts on both the building, the pedestrians and the parks. It is a known negative impact, period. That was in their environmental study. What you're not showing is when you're looking at the dock where it currently is now, is that the outline that you have means you're moving the dock beyond where the boats currently sit so the boats, when they are at the docks, and I don't care if it's for one day, one hour, it's just not that offended. The and the boats would be parallel to the children's park and the open space. And what I do not understand and cannot get behind under any day, shape, or form is you're going to be working on the marina. The RFP from the marina is up around the same time that the construction projects will be happening. 
So therefore, they will have diminished capacity no matter what due to construction. So the impact of moving it south 150 feet is not the same as it would be as if you moved it today because they will already be in a full construction site at the same time. And the environmental impact you're putting on is on the people who utilize the parks and who live here 24 seven. It's untenable, period. I mean, this, it's a no go. And the Port Authority did not say that they needed it to move north. So we asked several times for who, is it Arcadis that says it has to move north? Who is saying it has to be moved north and it cannot be moved south? And under what justification? So I can respond to that. Um, maybe before I get into the technical response, um, is, is there anybody from the authority, but, you know, Claudia or Gwen, I want to talk about the conversations we've had with Brookfield about that. I think there's the answer that Brookfield wants it north. Yeah, I, well, okay, so, so, oh, sorry, go. There, there are a number of things that are happening here. Um, we've got a number of things that we're trying to understand. Um, and as I've said on a number of occasions, there's, there's a lot more conversation that needs to happen about this particular point. We are not at a point right now where we can say definitively pretty much anything about the location of this ferry terminal. We are looking at it. We're looking at what needs to happen and for how long, where it could go if it needs to be moved, um, in which direction. There is other infrastructure here that um, that also must be taken into account. There, there are intake. Um, um, Gwen, Gwen, before you keep going, let me ask you, let, I, I'm going to interrupt you for one thing and I, and only because this is not a new conversation. The ferry, the ferry terminal used to be 150 feet south. That's where it temporarily was before it moved into this permanent location. So we know from the 10 years that it was in that location that it is possible to be there. What we're asking is who has said, because we were told at many meetings that moving it south was impossible. We wanna know who has said that, why it's been said and know the studies and see, because it's, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a fair question to ask. And there's no reason, no good reason to put a burden of that kind of magnitude anywhere closer to public realm space. I don't care what kind of pedestrian access we're talking about. It comes in waves, the pedestrian access, and there is plenty of space where it currently is and driving through. It, it, it just, it, there's, it's, there's no hiding, it's not hiding the ball necessarily, but we've asked many times, the slides need to be very specific. There's no one that I have ever heard in the community that wants it moved closer to the playground and the open space. Or the buildings, the noise factor. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even gonna use the residence because that's everybody knows that. There's, there's a residential building immediately there. We have heard this loud and clear heard it and, and and i will tell you no one has shown me anything yet that that indicates that anything is impossible um so there may have been preferences expressed there may have been some pushback on certain ideas but I, this conversation is an ongoing conversation there has been no decision made about this so I, I understand. I've heard your your concern. I've heard all the concerns at the at the public meetings. This is an ongoing conversation. 
this is not a this this document you see here this this image you see here that's not a final product um so let's keep talking let's figure it out uh, we can provide you with the information you're looking for we can get greater clarity on on what the options and alternatives are so that we're uh in a position to collectively um come up with a way to 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 move things forward that's great it's the same question we asked in september what engineering firm suggested it where were the studies done details on why a southern siting is not being considered and who's lobbying for those efforts and why they were asked we're still asking I hear you're saying it's it's still in discussion, but what concerns me is I don't see the second side of it's possible to move south, nor do I see when we're looking at drawings like this and a scoping, I personally believe as a member of the public, fighting for the public, that it needs to be more transparent in the slide presentation where you're considering the alignment of moving that north because i'm looking and seeing it i mean i can't wait to hear what dan barbara paul and everybody else is to, to look to understand exactly where it is not not including the river house tenancy who as you well know and nick can tell you in the yep. winter time we have already started hearing from them they know when a boat has been swapped out they're rattled out of the beds first thing in the morning. And it will only get worse if it moves north. So so this is something that I don't know that we have much, much, there's not much negotiation room here for us moving north. It, it just can't happen. So we have to figure out something else. I guess that's what Tammy is trying to say to you. And And I hear that it's not decided. That's great. I hear that you're looking at options. That's all great. But I really think it's going to be a real big problem if it moves north. And we're it, not it, seeing other options presented. We keep that's seeing right. this, and we keep and that's seeing why we're harping the same on same thing. Yeah. So Gwen, just 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 hear the words because the people who live there and the people who play there, or whatever else. It to me, it's actually the people who live there because because it's going to move north. But if the if the areas under construction maybe people won't be there but whatever let's let's move on and let's get let's move this because it's getting late we hear you we have this as part of scoping we need to look at the environmental impacts all the way around with noise with pollution with everything else about north south staying the same but thank you and thank you for for your comments Gwen. i appreciate it and tammy thank you hey okay, just Dan yeah, I'm we sorry. have to hurry up. I know, this right? Is, this, this isn't explored. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm sorry. This isn't explored. I just had a question because I am on those emails as you are, and Tammy is, and Lucian yeah. is. Um, just so I have clarification and perhaps helpful for the team. My understanding is, and correct me if I'm misstating it or not getting it completely correct, the primary concern is the noise from the vessels. Um, no, and it is. The environmental the biggest concern. The, it Go is ahead. it is both noise and environmental impact that was that was noted and acknowledged by the Port Authority and EDC that yeah. it negatively impacted, but because it was not further north, basically, right. they stayed and the duration of the boats was not as long that it was not an impact, but it would be noted that as the services scaled, there yeah. would be higher impacts and greater concern and needed more study. At the same yes. time, the Port Authority ensured us that they were looking towards electric boats, working yep. on refits, et cetera, et cetera. And quieter boats, right? Correct. Quieter, yeah, that's what the so refits it's are. Noise, yeah. the tier three. It's the, the, the different tier, tier engines, tier I know, three and tier four, they're, they're not. I'm not getting into boats right. here. Yeah, Nick. I, but, but they're not noise, cutting it. Is the it's noise. It's air. It's, it's hours yeah. of operation. It's everything that goes with it, and all the negative impacts. We'll be happy to tag back in the scoping hearing for you based on the environmental impact statement that they had. I mean, and putting it further north, obviously, then impacts a greater bulk of people. The trees, the this, the that. So, I mean, I don't want to. I'm not going to go into this. No. This isn't all of that. 
quick yeah. but, but to answer your question specifically it's it's it is everything. It is the noise for the people who are in the building at Two River Terrace, but then the people who are walking on the Esplanade, who are playing in the parks, who are at the duck pond, who are just passing through tourists, they are impacted by the noise. They're impacted by the air pollution and um, God knows what else, but th those two things. And then, of course, the, 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 the water pollution that's happening. But anyway, so it, it's it's more than it's a lot. Yeah, no, I understand it. I don't want to belabor. OK, just. I understand. Yeah, it, no, I boat, hear you, in, but it's in, a lot. In, in, in a parallel universe where the boats were at a, a different tier, where they weren't as noisy and they were electric boats, you would have less noise and you wouldn't have pollution, right? Yes. Okay. It, okay. You would still yes. have the horns. You still have, have horns, horns, right. So you would still have, because that's federally required for them to harm. Yes. You know, but, out, so, okay. We don't have, we don't have electric boats. Yeah. They're not built for electric docking. There's and no redocking. And they still keep putting the 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 noisy boats so yeah oh no i get it i get the emails too okay no that's that's helpful all right. thank you so it's, let's it's move on noise is hard, got... but not not all of it very helpful I'm, I'm getting nasty grams about the time thank you guys all right all right so so this is uh, justine you're going to go through the comments on this reach or we're going to shift the reach box oh we're going to have you got questions we okay. got to talk to dan we've got barbara ireland we've got paul who i think is at, uh, we've got paul and we've got Brittany. Again, so let's do it in order. And Wendy. Oh, and Wendy. Wendy, can we let the attendees go first? Go ahead, Dan, you're unmuted. Yeah, okay, let's hi. Let's give uh, it to a minute. So, yeah, yeah this will be quick. I mean, quick. I guess it, it's a simple yes or no question. Is there a structural engineering question or reason to have the wall in front of the playground in the duck park or not? No structural engineering question. It's something that we're discussing. So, so, so there's no the answer is no. no. There's not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Barbara. You're uh, unmuted, Barbara. So I just wanted to make sure that we've added to the scope the people flow, the value of all the parks in Battery Park City is the views. The relaxation, the greenery, the nature, and through these models, granted they're preliminary, I've seen many pathways that don't make sense. We have a very high volume of traffic, whether it's double wide strollers, bicycles, skateboarders, seniors, people just strolling, and they come for the view in the park, and they need to have a logical pathway. There's high volumes of tourists, tri-staters, locals. So please make sure we have a good flow of people movement throughout these parks. The benches that I've seen throughout these models are not uh, good for senior citizens with no backs. And this seems like it's a, tre a trending from a it's little little city park or whatever it's called all the way through Hudson where there's no backs on on benches then they're stacked so please make sure that we have enough um benches and people flow in these areas I appreciate it thank you Barbara Paul oh Britain yeah Paul Thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Justine. Yeah, I would echo the points with respect to the alignment of the wall um, around the playground uh, and the duck pond. I mean, it strikes me if I look at the illustration on the screen right now, the, the black dotted line to the east uh, of the uh, of, of the uh, playground, in other words, to the bottom of the slide, you know, if that was the alignment of the wall, uh, lo mm -hmm. and behold, you don't have to bisect the duck pond. A new water feature is fine, but you know, the, the duck pond's the duck pond at the end of the day, and a new water feature is, you know, new water features just isn't the same. Um, I would also note that currently immediately to the west of the duck pond, so closer to the river, is a raised area with a balustrade. And once again, it's a, just a, you know, it's a, it's a balustrade, I don't know, a porous balustrade, 
trade. I don't know what the technical term is, which again, presumably that could be solidified and stick a foot, you know, made a foot higher. And suddenly you've got an, either an attenuation, if not a barrier feature at that point as well. So I'd, I encourage you to look at that. With respect to the ferry terminal, I do note that the intention is to revert it to the original location uh, eventually. However, um, I would argue that moving it south, as, as has been noted before, it's been there before. So any argument that it is impossible for it to be south simply doesn't, pardon the pun, hold water. Um, it's been there before. It can, you know, <laughs> why can't it go there again? It's not impossible. Um, also, I would argue that moving it south would be a far better outcome from a foot traffic perspective, because at the moment you have two, set, two main sets of pedestrians who get off the ferries, one going to Goldman's and one going into Brookfield. OK, the Goldman's people might have to walk an extra 75 feet, but actually for the people going into Brookfield, into the, the old World Financial Centre buildings, it's actually a better outcome for them to come out of the ferry wharf, turn right and then turn left. It's a shorter walk. The only people who would suffer would be the, the, the Lululemon and the Club Monaco in that mall, you know, the Brookfield Mall off Vesey Street, where if someone's coming at, you know, to their office at 7.30 in the morning and figures they've forgotten their gym gear and needs to duck into Lululemon. But from the actual, you know, pedestrian's point of view, the, it, it's actually a shorter walk. If it was moved 150 feet south, you know, you actually, yeah, it would be far better for those people getting off the ferry who are going to Brookfield. Um, you know, it, it would make little difference you know, the, the, the Goldmanites would have to walk an extra, you know, 100 feet or so. Um, and I would argue also that electric boats, you know, the, we talk about electric boats, eh, they ain't going to be here for a long time. So let's take them out of the equation. Thank you so much, Paul. Well said. Brittany. And then Michelle. And then Wendy. Thanks. I was going to echo what Paul said, um, probably in a less funny way, um, however. Um, being someone that does work in Brookfield, I will tell you a lot of my colleagues um, can commute on those ferries, and I will say that they probably have the preference for it to go south. So I hope in the next iterations, um, Gwen, if you, if you are serious that it's not a decision that's been finalized, we see the options for, I see it moving north, I see it you know, where it is. And I hope in the next iterations, we then see it moving south. And I think maybe a consideration to permanently keep it south, because again, I, I actually do think it's better for the employees that work in those buildings too, as well as the residents and the kids at the playground, if it, if it goes back um, down south permanently. Um, so I, th I hope, I hope that that is yeah. a consideration. The other piece I will say is, and it goes back to funding, um, we talked about federal, someone mentioned state funding. You know, there are a lot of proposals for corporate entities that are going to have to start reporting on their climate change, their GHG inventories, as well as coming out of Europe. Brookfield, I can almost bet you, is going to have to start reporting on their impacts on local communities, as well as their impacts on biodiversity ecosystems of where they operate their buildings. Um, and being that that's their headquarters, um, they're going to have to start showing that they're making positive impacts in their communities. So I would also seek out maybe some funding from those corporate entities as well, who are looking to make investments into the local communities where they operate to be able to put something in their um, disclosures that have to that are that are going to be subject to the EU requirements, which Brookfield will be subject to most likely. So you know, don't just stop at state and federal. I would also look at corporate. That's a good point. Thank you, Brittany. Appreciate it. Michelle. Hi, I have to go. And before I do so, I wanted to just add something to something that I had said before, but it's not about that re this reach. Is it okay? It's okay. Quick. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to go back to um, where I was talking about before where um, where Miramar is because yes. they're not here to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know if they really understand or know what's going on, but I just wanted to make a comment that um, we really need to look at how any kind of uh, wall built around or near Miramar would impact their business. And I have a feeling it would destroy their business. I think it would destroy their business. I think you're yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So I think that really, I, I just wanted to speak up for them and um, so that Thank that you. could be also included. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Michelle. Appreciate it. Because yes, that is an economic impact to businesses. That is one yeah. of the sloping points. Yeah, I mean that people go there because of the view and sitting outside yeah. there. Their entire business, of course, you know, is in the spring, summer, and you know, up you know up to like maybe October. And and um, it's an outside business as opposed to an inside business. And it would there's no there's no question in my mind that that would that that would just destroy their business. Yeah, so, agreed. All right, thank, thank you so much. Appreciate thank, it. Okay, thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate uh, spending the time with everyone and learning so much. Thank you so much. Um, all right, maybe we go to the next reach. Oh no, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. Sorry, Wendy. <laughs> all right, I'll try and be quick. Um, uh, so I'm I'm back in the uh, in the where the line gets drawn in terms of be, you know on what side of the playground, but. Mm. The other thing I wanted to just mention is that um, right now the playground, it's showing a wall you can see there above with that circle. Mm -hmm. And as we know, um, we had many discussions about this, about Wagner. And one of the reasons we couldn't put a wall in there is because the city has a program that they are universally taking walls down around playgrounds all over the city because of safety. So, um, a wall that becomes a hill that has surrounded by uh, earth and flowers and things like that, because we know that's already in Rockefeller Park. They have those wonderful little hills with uh, with greenery on it. It can't be trees. We understand it has to be, um, you know, grasses or or flowers because the tree roots can destroy the uh, the wall. We did learn that also in the Wagner discussion for just as a little background for those of you who weren't here five and six years ago. Um, but I just wanted to say that if there is a, if, if it's decided that the playground's being protected and I would like to ask, I don't know if this is design or scoping, it's environmental is question, but there's a cost benefit analysis because you've just fixed the park or the playground, you don't want to fix it again. So it's like the ball fields, you make an economic decision that you want to protect it. Um, but if that is the case, that it's not a wall, that it's actually a, a beautiful, hilly, flowery, grassy place that um, children can run up and down. And it's also universally accessible um, via like zig zig zigzagging ramps to go over the top um, because the... Um, you know, that's the whole argument that we couldn't have a wall. <laughs> so yeah. you know, that was a big discussion, a big thing. And um, we just want to be consistent. And I do think safety is an issue. And I would also say that if this new um, proposal goes through there, I, I would just say we're going to need to study light pollution because I would ask that there's a lot more lighting put into the park because they're going to be these hiding places and therefore yeah. light them because um, we know that helps with safety, but then lighting it creates light pollution. Um, so it's not an easy situation as well. So I think one of the, the pieces of it is that we're gonna have to greatly enhance the lighting and then hopefully some of that lighting can be solar sourced or, you know, mm. I, there should be some element in there of solar lighting we you know you see it everywhere else why can't it be incorporated into some of these places it would be a great teaching moment for our kids as well Thanks. great points all thank you wendy all right I, I think that was perfect all right next peter we are keep going to next slide oh my god you have to get to the page 90 god help me let's go let's, let's. all right this is cry. all right so <clears throat> Like, like the pattern here, we're, we're going to you know, go to the visuals and prompt the question. So this is the existing condition. Um, next slide. This is the preliminary proposed. And again, we've, we've, we've taken your feedback and we've tried to draw it in a way so that the, the height off the deck or off where you're standing is, is more understandable. I think the next set of slides focuses in on certain regions. If you go on to the next slide, yeah, so you can see existing plaza. And the next slide is the is the um, the step seating that we're proposing there. And then the next slide is that corner um, at, at Belvedere. And then the following and slide. We would love to see a slide over there, right, with that one that includes the ferry dock. 
moved further south because as you can tell even in your preliminary proposal there are large walkways available mm -hmm. definitely the comment is received in um next slide and this is the overall so maybe let's start with the questions um I can I can glance at the questions that were provided, but if people want to begin to ask questions, we can respond to those. Anybody have questions about this? Tammy, you you were saying something about the walkways. So there is the conversation on this starts to become a question with the Battery Park City Authority because we do know um, right now that is a current shared walkway space. Um, the entire area is both bicycle and pedestrian friendly with the new growth that you're looking at, um, not to get down opportunities to the water, but um, it, it looks like there is levels of seating that are mm. gone other than steps currently there are artwork and seating and tons of tables public, right? tables and chairs that are publicly accessible for the public realm i don't know if this plan incorporates and includes all of that that's one question for the authority in particular and two um it doesn't look like there's been any reimagination of any kind of safety and enhancement to provide dedicated places for bicyclists versus pedestrians. And that has been a large topic of conversation, which I'm sure Peter knows nothing about because he wasn't here for those kinds of stuff. Peter, do you know? Yeah, um, that, oh, I'm, you're correct. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just, you know, again, I, this is the same, you know, the same concept here where we're, we're putting together visualizations and renderings um, gotcha. ahead of the design process, recognizing that during the design process, people movement is going to be studied and there's certain choke points right now that are recognized. And I think that you know, part of the design process will be to explore that and understand what can be done to mitigate those choke points. Um, but but I, I don't understand the full history. Tim. Okay, so we'll put that in the scoping document yeah. about uh, yeah. choke points and the interplay between pedestrian and bicycle traffic along the back of the Esplanade, as well as the robust public seating that seems to be missing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Jeff, have you? You've got your hand raised. And Brittany too. Oh, a lot of people in the attendees. But go ahead, Jeff. Unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, sure. Um, uh, I want to echo the uh, comments about um, uh, pinch points and pedestrians and, and so forth. And I think, you know, 1 of the points that we'll be adding to this scoping document. Um, I mean, it, it, it may be already. Covered in the, the, the scoping document, but this under transportation, really the circulation within Battery Park City is critically important of all modes of transportation and particularly pedestrians and bicycles. And um, as it is, the marina area is already something of a choke point and, um, and it looks like it's going to become chokier with at least this representation mm -hmm. and the, the the flood wall measures kind of inherently um, uh, negatively impact uh, circulation, uh, at least to the extent that they are not uh, deployable um, uh, flood barriers. Um, and so I, I, I just want to just echo that that's an incredibly important point. Um, a second point I wanted to make on this slide is that um, it, it, it kind of goes overall to everything in the project, but I'll give a specific example, and that is don't fix what's not broken. Um, and uh, Esplanade Plaza is actually a wonderful place as it is. Exactly. Um, um, it it doesn't need trees to block the view. Um, 
it's currently basically acts as a public square. It's the it's a place where people play volleyball, where people play pickleball, where children learn how to ride bicycles, where kids run around, um, and you have you know wonderful views of the water and so forth. And I know from perhaps a um, uh, a landscape architect's perspective, um, maybe the instinct is well, it's just a bare concrete or paver plaza. But it's, it works as a wonderful place um, as as it is, and there may be other there are other aspects. Whether it's the Esplanade, and I realize that in Reach, you know, we already talked about Reach Six, um, but um, it, it's apparent that the usable portion of the Esplanade will shrink uh, as a result of any of these um, uh, measures in terms of the width of the es Esplanade. And that's both important in terms of transportation and circulation, as well as just the, the wonderfulness of, of that space. And so I, I would urge that the, as the um, uh, measures are evaluated for areas where the Esplanade is narrow, such as there, um, that um, you know, keeping the current character as close to what it is, it, what it is now is, I think, an important objective. There, there, there will be limits on what is physically possible, but it works as it is if you want to preserve what works. So those are my points. Thank you, Jeff. I think those are really good points. Um, before I go to the attendees, I've got Brittany, Dan, and Paul. I just want to ask a question about where it says reimagined plaza in the middle there. And um, it also says replaced platform. Why is the platform having to be replaced and only a portion of the platform in front right. of Pump House Park? Right. So, so a couple of things. The, the exact contour of the water's edge is shown as a concept rendering here, like the opportunity for get down to water. You know, Jeff, you pointed out that that exacerbates the choke point. Yes, we recognize that. I mean, I think we're we're showing that because. You know, you know, this image is intended to sort of convey an aesthetic, and you know that that was part of that. But we recognize, you know, there's a there's a technical issue associated with that, and it's a pedestrian flow issue associated with that, and so there hasn't been an explicit commitment to do that. Um, okay. Reimagined okay. Plaza is a is a, actually you know what um, I'm going to pass the mic to Jeremy. Jeremy, can you when we talk about Reimagined Plaza, um, can you speak to that? Um, uh, are you able to hear me well? Yep. Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. <clears throat> uh, so, um, I mean, in terms of the reimagined plaza, I mean, basically to answer the second part of your, your question, why are we, um, uh, replacing platform in order to get the flood protection to move through this area? Um, and, you know, as Peter spoke about earlier, we're. Running the flood protection through this area in order to avoid the, uh, the really burdensome view impact and other impacts of running it along the water edge itself. So. If we're moving it through this area in order to get it to bridge over those, um. Uh, the, the path tunnels and the platform that actually sits above them. So this platform that actually moves inland moving. Um, east, we basically need to. Um, replace platform above those areas because they're very significant structures. There's a fair amount of, um, of, of impact associated with that. And so as we replace what is there, um, we will necessarily have to um, reorganize and reconstruct um, some of this plaza. What we think is that this is an opportunity to optimize it um, for the uses that it has been uh, undertaking over the last decades and, and, and those uses that, it, that, that the operator and also the public might want to see in the future. So it really is a canvas. Um, and over the next months, we will be undertaking design engagement to understand what, what those desires are. You know, I, I think there have been some really great points made on this call um, about Esplanade Plaza. Um, and, and I think you know, there, there are probably similar comments that go for this area. In terms of what people like about it today, what what could be better, um, so that's really 
what we mean when we say reimagine plaza. There's an opportunity there that as we build it back, we can build it back better. And um and that's really the that's the extent of 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 where we are right now. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate so, that. Justine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to put in the scoping document yep. then about consideration for when they reimagine the plaza and, and look at continued as he put it, the uses that are currently done Correct. versus what it was intended, that they are also taking a consideration for the light, noise, sound, yeah. and everything about the residential and the operating office buildings. And because it is now, it was not necessarily intended as an events plaza, but, but that is a primary use of it. And mm -hmm. the opportunities that it has and the potential impacts that it have have to then be put into a scoping document. That makes sense, Tammy. You took the words out of my mouth. That's where I was going. Can I, can I just ask uh, yep. in by the tunnel being impacted? Because I know the tunnels come through there, but is it that the tunnel can't take the weight or it's going to the wave and the flooding will deteriorate the tunnel or you're just working around the tunnel or what did you mean by the tunnel impact? Right, so put that one back over to Peter. Yeah. Yeah. So the the plaza area is elevated above the water. If, you, if we were fishes, we would be able to swim into the cove, and then we would be able to continue eastward for quite a distance. We have to put some barrier in that water space to prevent surge pushing eastward. And so we have to build a wall under the plaza and that plaza and that wall under the plaza has to actually span over the path tubes. So, you know, and this gets to the point, Tammy, you know, this, this option of going on the edge, that's a regulatory option. It, because when we go to the regulators to discuss what we're proposing to do, we know they're going to ask us to explore that because the option at the edge of the marina doesn't in any way impact the continuity of that water between the cove and the Brookfield platform as it currently exists today. If I was a fish today, I could swim in the cove, I can go underneath the Brookfield. If we put our flood barrier under the plaza, it's going to interrupt where that fish swims and the regulators are going to want to talk to us about that. That's why we're holding that outer thing from a regulatory perspective, because we know they're going to ask us to look at it. So, so I hope that answers it. So today the fish can swim under the platform almost to the edge of the winter garden. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they can swim quite a bit. I, I don't know the exact distance, but there's four acres of darkened water underneath Brookfield. Almost all the way to West Street, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's underneath Brookfield, it has to go all the way to West Street almost. Wow. Okay. That makes sense because West Street used to be the so, end of the island and we were we were all shipping piers. Yeah. Anything that was out this way. So yeah. That makes sense. I, I think in the scoping document, I would really like a description of that and to spell it out because if when people go and read this uh in the future, that's I mean, I didn't know any of this. So that I just that's just something I heard tonight. Maybe we've talked about it before, but I've never remembered it. <laughs> Um, I don't know if it's news to other people, but, um, but that's a big deal. So. We can definitely put that to take a look at the impact on the. Cause the, call, I believe it's brown is. I don't remember, is it brown or black water? I don't know. It's, um. From, yeah, it depends on what agency you talk to. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's regulators open water. <laughs> wow. <laughs> There's that much marine life under there is completely news to me. I thought it was just, you know, maybe it went in a little bit, but not um, yeah. something more like what, what happens in Wagner, where it goes, you know, just in a few feet. Uh, this sounds like it's something entirely differently. So I understand now why you might want to have more of a, a green space, although I was with Jeff, like, I think, you know, works perfectly the way it is, but oh. I that's really big news. Uh, so anyway, just to me, thank you. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And and Tim and Wendy, if, if there's a way to keep it 
as simple as it is, that would be great, but there may be reasons why not. Yeah, this gets back. We want to that middle. played out. Right, why we put reimagined plaza? Because you're basically reconstructing some of the plaza as a necessity to deal with what's beneath the plaza. I, I mean, who do you want from the public? So I'll send Brittany, and then Dan, and then um, Barbara. Brittany, okay, I hit Brittany's mic. Brittany, you're open. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a couple comments. Um, number one, one thing that I've heard, I, I don't personally have a dog. But I've heard from people, and maybe this is an area we could put it in somewhere, is um, there's a desire for a real grass dog run in Battery Park City. Um, so just putting that out there because there's some passionate dog owners that would like some green space for their dogs. Um, the other thing kind of similar is, um, you know, when I look at Belvedere Plaza, you know, for me, it's like, you know, there's a bunch of concrete with some benches and, 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 and um, gardens and trees, and it's great, but there could be opportunities to add more green space or add wetland or do, you know, do something that's a little bit more soppy there um, in case water comes up um, over that. So maybe something just to think about. My question is, is when I'm looking at, and I'm, kind of looking where PJ Clark's is. I don't know if you're familiar with, with PJ Clark's um, in particular, but it's on the north side. And I see the flood alignment. And then I see a bunch of trees kind of drawn right next to it. Um, you know, and, and kind of throughout here is you see the flood alignment and then trees. How do I think about um, like the wall going in and proximity of trees? Are we planting trees? Are trees able to be next to the flood alignment? You know, this wall? How do I think about that? It's a great question, and I think it's something that we are going to begin to detail more and more out as we progress the design. You know, I know I, I said this, I sound like a you know a broken record here, but like you know, the purpose of these drawings is to convey a concept of an alignment that has some what so that it's able to be um, engaged by people who are not technical or people who are lay people. And in order to do that, generally these types of drawings are ornamented and the ornamentation is trying to capture the aesthetic that we're trying to track towards. So, you know, is our design specifically to put a lot of trees, you know, right along, you know, I, I don't think we've, we've solved for that or worked for that just yet. But the purpose of the meetings that we're going to have upcoming with you as we get into these reach specific community engagement meetings is to talk more about the design choices in the immediate proximity of those barriers and sorry to interrupt you too sorry i just want to say you should can you just talk a, a bit just to address Brittany's point about the offset oh yeah the female offset requirement for trees because i think that that also directly addresses your question yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah, exactly that's what i was wondering yeah. you thought we yeah. said 15 feet before yeah i mean there's guidance from fema that says and the core that says you know when you build a flood wall you know you try at all possible costs to make that flood wall accessible and maintainable and inspectable throughout the length of its design life. And so we tried to maintain a barrier around a barrier, a buffer around the elements that we build so that we can have easy and convenient access. We can do the annual inspections. We can do testing if required. We can make repairs if necessary. And so that's um, part of how we think about our alignments. And so when we begin to show more detail on the alignments, you'll begin to see where we can get them to have a, more of those buffers. Okay, so it's not so we're, you need to be able to to um, inspect it and see it and access it. It's not necessarily a requirement of like nothing. There can be no plant that's within fifteen feet. Yeah, I would I would just say you know broadly that's the that's the that's that's the um, that's the recommendations that we get from FEMA and from the Corps of Engineers. Um, for all types of flood protection structures, and we're applying that here in this case, even though the context is very urban and is unique, we still want to apply the same types of guiding principles. Okay, that's helpful. We were basically told that, you know, you could put perennials, you know, but small, small roots like grasses or flowers or that type of thing, but you're not going to plant. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, that, that impacts all the reaches, right? Like you see, even next to Rockefeller, like next to Rockefeller, there's trees right next to that existing wall, right? right? Which is because that 
does that mean that all those trees, you know, along, if it, you look at where the reaches are and the walls and the alignments that at 15 feet on both sides can have no trees like that, that means that there's a lot of trees coming down really. Right. I think that, I think what we're, I think what we're saying is, you know, there's established principles in, in the engineering practice for flood protection systems. And we want to try to maintain those practices when we design this. The discussions are very specific to the reaches themselves and the types of um, the heights that we're designing to, what we're doing beneath the surface, how we're handling seepage beneath the surface. There's a bunch of technical details that sort of contextualize mm -hmm. each conversation that that we, that we really, frankly, haven't gotten into yet in the design process. But mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to talk quite a bit about. I think when we have the you know the community meetings that are reach specific, because we'll have a little bit more design details so that we can get into those conversations more specifically. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's a specific area of interest of like as you're looking at it, you Absolutely. might make yeah. a different decision if you realize like, oh no, there's no trees around here at all, and right. we're gonna yeah. have to all these trees. Yep. That makes sense. That's a really good point, Brittany. Thank you, yeah. Dan. And sorry, hold on before you meet, but I just want to say thank you to Peter. I know that you've been going on for like four hours now and you're doing a really good job answering all our questions. Yeah, well, you've all been <laughs> going on with me, so it's a, we should all well, go. You're so, talking more yeah. than one of us, so it's, yes. it's multiple on one, um, but it is really appreciated, I, I want to say, and, and you've done a really good job of, of being clear and, and articulating. Um, to, you know, to the best of your ability when you can. It's so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Brittany. Appreciate it. All right, Dan and then Barbara. Yeah, I, I echo Brittany. Peter, you're an animal. Um, but uh, I so looking at this, I just want to make sure I'm clear. The, the bubble on the lower right shows a four foot increase or essentially a wall between the current grade of the upper seating area. Uh, so essentially a four foot increase. And my question is, given that that is the primary sort of open seating area for that whole area that is largely dependent on the views, when you are sitting down, if there is a four foot raise, you will not be able to see the water. And I fear um, that you will essentially destroy the value of that seating area. Is there an alternative that can be moved closer to the mall or along the mall, similar to the way it's being done at Stuyvesant that can preserve the sort of views and integrity of that area? Because a four foot wall that impedes the view while seating in the water will effectively destroy the most highly used public uh, sort of space in that area. Wells in the Winter Garden. As so, well, garden, but but you know it's really that that outdoor area that's that's a treasure. Totally understood. So I, I think um, it's a great question. The design team is really focusing in on this. You know, this is one of those places in alignment where every six inches makes a really big difference. And so you know, we know what we're doing is we're going to follow a process, right? We're we're getting through the concept design. Once we get into um, um, a place in the design where we have the physicality of the extent of reach five, more or less intact, we're going to begin to model it and we're going to begin to understand, you know, um, and test our assumptions, particularly in wave run up. You know, getting back to the wave run up conversation, you know, here's another unique path, right? Waves have a sort of an open environment in the Hudson. They come into the marina in some dampened way because of the breakwaters, right? And so that really helps us. And then what helps us even more is that there's then this 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 runway that they have to sort of energize themselves over to get to where we have our alignment. So all of those different elements help us attenuate that wave. And what we're going to do in our um, um, design is try to maximize as much as we can all those different ways of tamping down those waves so that the design choices that we have in that location that you've highlighted have the least interventions as possible. Right, but I guess my point is that you know, there's a two foot wall by PJ Clark, which you can see over while seating. If if you make that wall four feet, that plaza will be a cave. Right, it's a great point. Absolutely, yeah. No, these are like I said, these are these are all very, very sensitive design considerations. 
um, on the project. And we're putting a lot of focus on, um, um, you know, the average component of these, all the design assumptions, the methodologies that we're choosing, and all the different interventions. And, you know, I would add to, you know, again, getting back to deployable, mechanized versus static, you know, this is also an, an opportunity where we're going to consider we'd like to see passive, passive systems here, but if there are certain parts of the system that, you know, need to be mechanized or deployable, that's something we'll consider as well because of the issues you're bringing up. Are you also considering? So hold on, hold on. So for Dan's comment for the scoping, it is about preserving views from the pump house park and the seating areas along the upper levels of the current um, seating areas so they are not turned into caves and they have consistent views out to the water. Dan, did I get that correct? Correct. And then that was one of the big issues with Wagner. Right. And so the point of the deployables is to utilize deployables to preserve views where possible. If possible, I mean, that's not, like I said, it's something that's in our yeah. toolkit and it's, yeah. it's, it's something that we'll, we'll try to solve as quickly as we can. Okay. During the Great. I just want to make sure that I'm translating it right so we can get it into the scoping documents. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Are there more questions? Uh, Barbara Ireland has her hand up. I think she was next. Hi, thank you. Just one more point. Um, I've seen several or, or a few of these get down to the water. Um, I believe there's three in the diagrams that we've seen in the draft. In each one of the three, it normally is a catch point for trash which doesn't seem like a desirable location for the get down. So if you could please um, make sure you add to the scope, the uh, tidal flow and the trash flow that accumulates in these areas before it's um, finalized. So you're talking about the natural sea flow and water and the existing conditions for where the debris rolls into North Cove Marina, right? Yes, it does. Yep. yep. Right? Thank you, and then Barbara. The, Good point. The other thing is, um, are we making accommodations for the sailing club? We definitely should put in there that we want to ensure that there are um, that the marina through the reconstruction and other areas are is still able to operate the sailing club. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's again, the scoping with employment and interfering with businesses. So very good points. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on. What's next? So next actually, person. In, in fact, I'm oh, sorry. Someone's going to say something. Uh, I think that was your last question in this reach, believe it or not. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, yeah we're actually, done with the questions here that I don't see anybody else's hand. And this is the last of the slides. The rest is an appendix. So we don't have to go through the 60 slides if anybody doesn't want to. Okay, so I then, actually think you have one more slide going down the back of Gateway. I apologize. Oh, I don't oh, think you've done that reach. It's okay. That's right. You're right. Correct. I apologize. Next slide then. Oh, no. no. Think, we is in reach six. If we did reach six. We, we, did, we reach did reach six, six yeah, yeah. Tammy. Yeah. Woo, woo. The back of oh, Gateway is, is, yeah. No, we did it all. So I have a question. When we're, if we're finished with this, I'd like to talk about financing and funding for a minute. May I? Just I'm not sure if you're the, only, the, only you, the only thing you have it, to do, Justine, is um, get a vote. Oh, so financing and funding is not part of the scoping. In I terms don't. of the, the one question was, well, because one of the questions, the very first one was, will the resiliency projects raise taxes? That's not relevant. Not to paying for it's not relevant to scoping. No. No, okay. what's relevant to scoping in terms of finance is to ensure Justine, that that's, that's correct. But the short answer to that. Sh... Okay, well, go ahead, Tammy. Go ahead. Is to ensure what? So tell me how to answer the question. It we just have to ensure that th amongst what we're doing for and looking at for scoping is that they look at it in a socioeconomically diverse way and that they are not removing any of the 
um, opportunities that are there, like, for example, the moorings, for example, free outdoor seating, seating for example, yeah, access sailing to pool. Yeah. public access to the water, public free open access. And we can even opine and say that we are looking for more opportunities to get down to the water because the marina sketches that they have, the marina is private property. Yeah, you can't do that. Correct. So what they're doing there is fantastic, but it actually doesn't help the public realm. That's private property. Yeah. So for the public realm, if we look at it and say we're looking for free opportunities, we could say that we want, if they're adding space on the north side, we could say we want a... uh, a lagoon area where people can, you know, do power boats. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. I mean, or, or right, paddle boats or something. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean, we can say whatever we want about. But, but it's private property, so they could do what they want. Well, is it just for saving people's lives. Is that what? What is that? The purpose of it, or is it just to slow the waves down? I guess. We can we can opine and say anything we want along those lines. We just need to make sure that we're not losing public space. If anything, that's that's the key to scoping. All right. I see we have one question from Brittany left. I will give you the floor, Brittany, but truly, Tammy, you're in charge of the mute. One minute. Okay, Brittany, unmute yourself. And you got one minute. uh, uh, (laughs) I I thought I saw in one of these scoping documents that the authority put in that there's no plans to apply for federal funds. So I think that there was one small sentence that basically says that there's not anticipated um, in there. That, that, that is correct. And if you look at the answers, they answered us, but it's not about scoping. We are not, that is, that is a topic you know is near and dear to my heart, financing. And I do have uh, questions about it and the federal funding, um, but it's not for tonight is what I've been told. So. Okay, it's, it's 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 not for tonight, but that's okay because we are part of December thirty first response. Correct. It's not the, it's exactly. So um, I'm gonna. I think we're good then because because we're not talking the finances tonight, but we will. And what I'd like to say to everybody here, first of all, thank you all for being here. It is ten o'clock, and you guys have done an amazing job of listening, asking questions. Thank you to the to the presenters. Thank you to to, to Peter because you you just were. Like, which went on and on. So that was lovely. Thank you. And I think you really helped everybody. What I want to make clear is, and I think um, it was said maybe early on, but I want to reiterate it. December 31st is the deadline to make comments on the draft scoping document. Once that's once this. They get their comments, they're going to have some meetings. They're going to have a final scoping document, which we also will have be able to have public comment to. This was such an important meeting because as as the design and as development goes farther down the line, it narrows what our choices are and it narrows our input. We always can say what we think. We always can do something. But um, once the authority goes down a path, they're going to get committed to that path. So this is why this is so important. And what I would say to everybody who's here, if you think about it, you look at the documents and you look at the um, links that were in the chat that Nick provided through or that Lucian provided from Nick, look at it. And if you have questions that you didn't get to ask, present it and put it online. Um, and what I want to do now for our committee and for the, I, I don't know if it's just us or if it's the folks here from environmental too, but everybody could weigh in. Lucian has agreed to, he took notes this whole time. He has agreed to put together a document that will become a resolution that will um, kind of summarize everything we talked about. And what we need to do tonight is take a vote to say, do we want to put this resolution together to have the comments for the scoping put forward? Um, We don't have anything in writing yet. It's not written. Um, So I I throw it out to to the committee. How do you want to handle this? Because we need we need to get this done before the 31st, which means we need to get it done present at full board. Justine, I'm just going to jump in. I want to, I want to thank Jeff. Jeff was right there with me uh, taking yeah. tons of notes. So between us, I think we've, I feel pretty confident we've got most of it. And yes, this, this, um, this resolution really needs to speak to the scope. Um, 
we we may be able to weave a little bit here and there on on what we've seen you know super preliminary design but we 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 don't want to really get off the tr track of of really getting into the nitty gritty of what needs to be studied here um mm -hmm. because that's just so crucial so that, yeah, that makes sense i think it makes or uh, justina makes total sense if you've got good notes to move forward yeah, I will do it. So, can we take a vote? Um, other folks on the on the committee. Yes, call the question. Yeah, I'll call okay, everybody's I'll... everybody who's voting needs to have a camera on. Okay, so give me a camera. I need I need Betty on camera. I need Bob is on Eric, camera. Okay, there we yeah. go. There we I go. need Eric is there. Um, gotcha. All right, I think that's all of you us. Got a I think that's all we got. On camera. And that's everybody. So, can we can we take everybody who is yes to this resolution? That has not been written yet. Yes. Oh, are you asking a question, Betty? No, you're voting yes. Betty, you're yeah. muted. You're muted. Still muted. Still mute. I mean, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. <laughs> but wait, say that again. Because now you wouldn't. I have no idea what I'm voting on because I've given no verbiage other than there's going to be a list, which I understand all that. But what are the therefore be? What's the resolution? What are we resolving? The, oh. I think the, the, re the resolution would be um, that, um, uh, you know, the following are our comments on the scoping document. And I'm not sure the mechanically the best way to, uh, uh, to do that one possibility that I'm personally comfortable with, although I've kind of cheated since I've had access to the notes, yeah. um, is that um, as, as between me and Lucian, we've captured all of the comments that have been made here at the meeting, and we are going to make them uh, in terms of the, uh, when I may say comments, comments on the scoping document, not and we've had lots of comments that go beyond the scoping document, but comments that are relevant to the scoping document that Lucian will then incorporate them into a draft resolution. And perhaps, I don't know if this is procedurally okay, but he can circulate the draft. You know, we will vote on it now. Uh, then he'll circulate the actual text of the resolution. And if any of us have issues with what made its way into the resolution or didn't make it in the resolution, we'll correct all of that um, and present it at the uh, for the board at the meeting and, and if we could get this done before executive perhaps um if there's anybody has some serious issue like pollution that's going to be you <laughs> and uh, with just with you and you and well executive is the day before the full board meeting i believe so <laughs> so so that it's means okay. yes the goal could, yeah. all right hold on guys the goal, goal is, is to get hold on justine the goal is to get the resolution listed to have it lucian's going to go over it now um, and to have the draft ready actually before the environmental protection committee, oh, even better. because okay. they're going to want to review it on the 19th in committee to see what the battery park city committee has done. They will come up with whatever friendly resolutions they need um, based on the documentation. And we will add that at the full board. Now I give it to Lucian for the procedural aspects of the there force. Yeah, I would, I would just say that the motion would be to commit all bona fide. Uh, scoping comments to be included. Um, I am not. I am not leaving anything out. If it if it was a comment made to include something in the scope, um, it is it is written down and it will be included because there is no cost. There's no zero sum game here. Uh, uh, we can include as many as we as we like. So if I heard something say this is something that it should study, um, and it and it sounded reasonable or germane. To, to this project, then it's on the it's on my my notes document. So um, you all will have an opportunity to see it before full board, um, and 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 we'll go from there. In terms of the therefores, that's 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 the the therefores. Um, yeah, it's just the, basically whereas saying whereas are going to be setting up, and and the fact and just kind of laying out what scoping is and where we are in the process. Oh, and so then that's, the therefore that's is the consider this, consider that. There are our the comments, and the following are our comments on the. Yeah. Yeah, scope. so that works for me because we, we can't tell anybody what to do, but we can tell them we want them to consider it. 
Is that correct? That's how it's going to be. Yeah, basically. it'll be that we we heard we we went through every single reach. Uh, mm -hmm. We we we, yeah. we looked at very preliminary design ideas and reacted to those based on what we know of Battery Park City community uses, natural environment, ecological aspects, view corridors, commercial activity. You know, uh, blah blah blah, and then the therefores will be thus. You know, re I'll go reach by reach, and then also have a general section where things are are multi reach. Multi reach, and we're not having any. Uh, are we saying don't move the ferry terminal, for example, or don't move it north or whatever, or we're not having that? It's comment. not. It's we're not saying, about don't move it. Oh, oh, it. Well, okay. I'm oh, shaking but... your head. Yes, we are. Okay, so that might be something we're betting because if we were going to okay, be so generic, make that clear. Because yeah, people said don't move it. I said don't move it or don't move in, it in the in north. the in the context in the context of how we're doing the scoping. Absolutely, it's I, in there. That, that's a right. legitimate uh, comment on the alternatives being considered. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That and makes sense. Get to that level. alternative whatever, uh, in, in in that it moves the ferry terminal in the wrong direction during construction. All right. Does I'll anybody have an Jeff issue with to that? To make sure that sounds right in the document. Yeah. 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 Does anybody have an issue with that, or can we vote yes on this? And it's okay to abstain if you have to abstain right now because you're not clear yet. But I vote yes. Uh, I'm okay, and I vote yes. I vote yes. Eric, I vote Bob. yes. Okay, Bob. Eric, you're yes. Is that? I vote yes. Is that a yes? Okay. Yeah. Betty, I think it's up to you at this point. Yeah, no, I was waiting for you to actually just hold a vote, but you know, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was my vote. That was my uh, unofficial vote. And Wendy, I don't know if you count or not, but thank you for voting yes. <laughs> <laughs> you always count, but you know what I mean. Wendy, Wendy will be one of the ones who leads in environmental protection to go over the drafts so yes. people can add um, and she'll take notes in environmental protection. Sorry, okay, did Wendy. you vote on this one? I did. My vote was okay. yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And I want to say thank you to, to Nick Spordone, to Gwen. To, I, I'm going to miss everybody who's here. But... So um, yeah, this has been a great, uh, from my perspective, this has been a perfectly long, but perfectly um, great interaction. And I think that this way of presenting it was really helpful. I think that the community that came, and I think I certainly got to ask the questions and this is the kind of engagement that we want. Um, and you've done a great job of partnering with us on this meeting. So thank you. Great and presentations. Please, and please, I encourage anybody who has not had a chance to read all the question answers that we were sent uh, prior to this meeting, please do so. So yeah. if anything comes up in your mind that you would like to add to the scoping that you're prepared and ready to do that either at environmental or the full board. And if okay. you're a member of the public that you can send that to us and you can also submit it directly to the BPCA. Correct. Because they did answer all those questions. So yes. um, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, we'll have Thank to think uh, at the environmental. I know we're also having the hat study and a few other things. So just timing wise, because this could take just as much time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's I mean, a good point. And keeping... it, it, this is just, it takes a long time and it's, you know, there's a lot of questions. So anyone who's, you know, there's going to be people on the committee that didn't come tonight that, you know, yeah. so it's just like, hold, on, hold on to your hats because in January. Uh, we talk about resiliency on the other side of the island. So, oh well, gosh, it, yes, we took yeah. the east side, right? And the hat study as well for the people that are on the call. Mm. There's an assumption. I just want to share it with everybody on the committee tonight because you might not come to some of the other meetings. The the caution that they put in the you know this is so preliminary whether it will even get funded by Congress in the future is just like a wild maybe. <laughs> oh so, my God, the hats, the, the, wow. Study is so far from being reality. So I just wanna make sure everyone understands that north of this project, and you know, if it goes up to North Moore, but north of this project, there is no, no money or no plan Correct. in place right now for North Tribeca and above. So, so it's just, I think there's a lot of, discussions like that it's like it's the same type of thing as 
what we're talking about tonight. It is not. <laughs> it's nowhere near it. No, there's nowhere. nowhere there's no there's money for a plan. <laughs> this is the only fully funded project other than ESCR and uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Esplanade. Even and those are and, baby little projects. And the wharf, um, because even CCLM, the Five I Seaport Master Plan, is unfunded in totality. Correct. So. And that federal money that we're talking about tonight that came up of over and over again, yeah. the HAT study is, you know, the you know the the federal money, you know, the federal, you know, that will be a federal program. Uh, obviously, states and cities have to contribute because that's the proportionality for any of these projects. You know, nothing is fully funded by the federal government. But um, you know, I just I just feel like we need to spend a little more time backing up and saying the HAT study isn't real yet. It's just an idea that may be real, and we should do everything we can to make it real. <laughs> Thank you. But we're not, and, not and it be. basically assumes that we're going to be doing what we're doing here in Battery Park City anyway. It doesn't really add anything to it. Exactly. And, and that, yeah, that was a, a good, twenty foot wall. And, that, and that, the, that. the other thing that I heard is that if the Battery Park City's project can prove that some of the the um, the the way to mitigate it still preserves like beautiful views or you know it, it looks nice it actually the people like it and and if it if if that happens and it's proven then they can avoid building just a straight 20 foot wall or whatever they're going to build they can actually incorporate proven strategies but like the federal government's even worse about like aesthetics like they're not going to have this back and forth like we're going through now uh, they're just going to build what they build in New Orleans, which is like big wall, big berm, you know, so wow. we want battery park to work. And then it works so well that they're like, oh, well, we can, we can copy that because that actually works and it's going to cost us the same amount of money or very similar amounts of money. So I just learned this whole concept that the, the federal government and the, and the army Corps, like they don't talk about aesthetics. So anyway, maybe they not yet. I mean, when did they present it at CB2? Um, I went to that yeah. and it was extremely clear that their first opportunity to potentially get approval for funding is late 2024. Exactly. It's the first and, and that's exactly. funding for the study. But and that I by the Nick way is an election hand. year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nick has his hand raised. Let's let's go ahead, Nick. Thanks, everybody. And, the, and then no offense, but I'd like to go to sleep. I know, me too. So, but go ahead, Nick. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you. Can, can you all hear me? I'll be very brief. Just a couple of quick housekeeping keeping items here for the, uh, for the group. And thank you again to Tammy, Justine, Lucian, who's a superstar um, for keeping us on task um, and getting everyone together here tonight. So very briefly for the benefit of those who have kind of stuck out for the, I guess, four hours now. Um, we really wanted to get through all the reaches. Thank you for helping us do that and giving us some great feedback along the way to Peter and the entire team and Glenn and Claudia. A um, couple of answers that came up that I just wanted to make sure that we addressed for the record. And again, not to scoping, but again, you guys stayed for all this time. So some some bonus answers, I guess. It's in the Q&A document, but just for the record, no, this project nor any of the Battery Park City Resiliency projects will result in a raise of taxes. These are funded okay, through pilots and ground rents, and it doesn't impact what you're going to pay as a resident. Just so a longer conversation that you like to have about whether it should or doesn't, but factually. No, 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 I'm not going to challenge you. I, I, based, I believe you're saying it will not increase taxes. I think yeah. the question was not, not that you recorded it wrong, but the yeah. question is inaccurate. The question should be whether the real resiliency projects will impede the BPCA and the city of New York's ability and or willingness to to decrease the projected annual increases in ground rent and pilot taxes. And I know that the BPCA can only speak to pilot, I'm sorry, to ground rent. Yes. The city could speak to, but, and I'm not asking for an answer right now, but yeah, no, so, so, so that was one thing I wanted to talk about. I wouldn't want people but to go ahead, keep going because it's late. Yeah. Um, second thing is on the, on the, the grant funding, I know Wendy touched on that a little bit um, and, and, and quite effectively, but again, it's in the Q&A document, but for the benefit of those who are here, Again, I want to make clear, while the Battery Park City Authority certainly would be receptive to the possibility of viable alternative funding sources, guidance we've gotten from the people who work in this space indicates to us that 
we likely would not be able to be a very good candidate for awarding of federal funds because we already have the ability to fund these things ourselves. And when you are competing for federal dollars against other cities and municipalities, one of the first questions is going to be, do you have a way to fund this? If the answer is yes, then that's a, a, a challenge. We're in some cases conceivably competing against other city projects in the city of New York that they are already allowing us to keep money here to fund. So again, we're not going to dismiss other possible funding sources, but our understanding is grant funding is, is a, could potentially be more of a challenge for those reasons, likely because we already have both the ability to fund it and uh, a finance structure that allows us to issue that debt to finance capital projects. Um, there was one question early on some hours ago now about design principles for the Northwest. That's also, I think, in the FAQ document, but very good question. And uh, indeed, as the design progresses, we will always be looking to track back those design decisions to those overall design uh, principles, which is, again is in the FAQ and was in the, I believe, the last presentation we made in September. We'll be repeated again as we, as we proceed apace. Uh, and then the last item for the group, just kind of a look ahead after the December 31st closeout for the preliminary public scoping document, what we would see then in January and February, as we committed to earlier, I think at EPC a few weeks ago, and again, uh, since in January and February, um, or I should say in the first quarter of the year, January, February, February, March, um, Tammy had discussed this at some great length as well, and Justine and I, and Jeff as well, thank you. We wanna do reach specific meetings um, that allow us to do a deeper dive. Again, all the questions tonight that we said, we can answer a little bit of it, some of it's design, it's more design and scope. We wanna do a deep dive on those design discussions, reach by reach. It will mean more meetings that we all get to see each other, but it will allow us to do kind of a little bit of a deeper dive on each instead of the broader look that we're, we are uh, generally taking because we're trying to get through a lot of the material. Um, so that was it, look forward to those dates. And we will uh, we will be back in touch with you soon. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for summarizing that too. That was I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think it was. We got some answers in there. Yeah, Thank Nick, you. I got another plug because I I still feel like signage is not we're not there yet. We we could do we could do neighborhood education. That's something I would yes. like to do. That we could, we could work on that in terms of teaching and and. You know, we're, we're, we're going to be the model for the country. You know, I think people are going to come and learn from us. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's yeah. wonderful. And we need to do better of getting the word out, which is, which is good because this was yeah, a great, I, this was a great meeting, but. Yeah, not just getting the word out, but also, you know, teaching it to, to people that are walking by the space. Mm, yes. That'll get people concerned and I like the idea of your chalk. But, um, let's let's call this a wrap because it is 4 hours <laughs> it is. and I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I'll tell you I'm done. So, Thanks. um, Brittany, bring your question to EP, the environmental committee meeting or put it in the scoping because it's just too late. Right? And and thank you all. Say, and right. I will cover some of this, but I just want to make sure everybody knows it's not a repeat of tonight's meeting because there are so many other agenda items as well. So we'll certainly cover it, but it will be uh, more in, in relation to the resolution. Yes, but it's, it's, right. and we will. I sent Brittany a, a thing to mute if she needed to. Oh, oh okay. Go ahead, thank Brittany. You. No, let's go. It's, it's, it's late. Thank you guys. Thanks for hosting. No. Everyone, thanks for participating. Um, and we'll just provide feedback on those FAQs um, as well. The I really yeah. appreciate that. Just send and, that in. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No. And thank you, Brittany. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, all. All right. Take night care, everybody. Good night. Good job. Thank you.